So, I just... Uh, 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 uh,
personalities in this room. The North American University warmly welcomes us all to join as it hosts its first annual international conference with a the theme of future of higher education in an online environment. This theme is so appropriate in today's situation of uncertainty, mainly because of the impact of the global pandemic, which has forced higher education institutions to not only transition to online teaching and learning, but also has brought up a number of new issues in the context of an online environment, like access, faculty readiness, course redesign, affordability, retention, and success of students, to name a few. The, the aim of this international conference is to share experiences, learn about how higher education in different countries has been transforming, and what is perceived as a future of higher education in an online environment. It is educational in nature and is intended to encompass and engage university administrators, scholars, educators, professionals, and interested community members from various countries. This one day conference is held on the North American University's campus today, Tuesday, July 20th, 2021, with three sessions during the day and a networking event afterward. It is also broadcasted live from North American University's website to benefit the audiences that would not be able to attend the conference in person. The potential audience for this conference is vast and encompasses participation from across the globe. Such an event, first and foremost, provides with an educational opportunity to learn about the impacts of global pandemic on higher education to not only students, faculty and administrators at North American University, but also of various universities from several countries. The participants will also benefit professionally by the opportunity to interact and network with educational leaders across the world. There lies an opportunity to stir a vigorous and constructive conversation that is sure to be a learning experience for all involved. We are indeed grateful to all speakers for their contributions to what making this conference a well-rounded and enlightening event. Before we officially open the conference, it brings me great pleasure to give everyone a bit of background on North American University. North American University was founded in 2010. It is one of the newest universities located in Stafford, Texas, and it is near the diverse metropolitan city of Houston, which is always full of opportunities. Our talented faculty and staff compose a dedicated team committed to the mission of the university. The diversity of our university's faculty, staff, and students influences our strengths, productivity, and intellectual personality. Our student body comes from across the United States of America and around the world. North American University is a private, not profit, full service college offering baccalaureate and graduate programs across three disciplines with several concentrations. North American University works very hard to ensure a low student to faculty ratio that promotes plenty of personal attention and mentoring opportunities. As an institution of higher learning, we are committed to global cultural competency and North American University offers a unique educational experience to our diverse students across the world. Our custom design learning pro programs provide excellent opportunities to prepare for a globalized professional in a world where cultural competency is an, indeed an asset. NAU was ranked number five among the best masters in computer science degree programs in 2021 by intelligent.com. We were ranked number seven among the best 15 criminal justice colleges in Texas in 2021 by the bestvalueschool.org. We were ranked number seven among the top 20 online counseling degree programs in 2021 by bestvalueschools.org. 
now that you know who we are as an institution, I officially open today's international conference titled The Future of Higher Education in an Online Environment. president of North American University and has been since 2016. He received his MD from the School of Medicine at Aggie University in 1976. He completed, completed his residency in otolaryngology, which is the study of air, nose, and throat from the same university and worked as a clinical fellow and professor in several other universities for over 30 years. Dr. Tickelin has received many scholarships from prestigious European universities. He also worked as a visiting research scholar in some other American and European universities and hospitals, including Hospital Cantonal de Geneve in Switzerland and Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Dr. Tekelen, to the mic. Thank you very much on behalf of my university for accepting uh, our invitation and coming. online lessons were recorded on video and students were able to benefit from it after the lessons. Although the active participation of all students was aimed in the online courses, it has been understood that this is not entirely possible in the feedback received from the instructors. Different solutions have been tried to overcome this deficiency which is uh, one of the biggest handicaps of online education. Our faculty give weekly assignments, discussions, 
and project to students and making quizzes to handle this problem. A survey was conducted with students regarding the impact of COVID-19 and online education. And as a result of the survey, it was seen that the students were generally satisfied with this education method. After summarizing the general experience of our university, I would like to explain some of my view on the future of higher education in all over the world. It seems that COVID-19 will lose its effect over time. And unfortunately, we don't know. This is not so much. As a medical doctor, unfortunately, people now don't use the mask. And this is very important. We should, again, be very careful for this season. But unfortunately, this morning, as today, for the Muslim people, this is the Eid al very important day. But everybody shakes, and then I say to everybody, and they don't have uh, the mask. This is very important. I would like that is to be very careful to remind you. However, after this COVID-19 experiences, we can guess uh, the most things about uh, education will not be the same as before. As you know, in online education, travel, accommodation, <clears throat> visa aren't required, and there are many alternative universities. For example, a student in the Asian continent can study online from different universities in a different continent. Because of this kind of demand, for online education, many students and universities may prefer online education instead of face-to-face -face in some areas. In my opinion, main difficulty in online education is quality and reliability. It is very difficult to achieve the quality of face-to-face -face education in online education in many courses, especially in science and computer science courses not only in science computer science, and especially in the medical sciences, especially in the surgery. Yes, we used before the video and then the atlas and then the picture, but if you don't enter to the operation, if you don't do all together with the, uh, your chief assistant, you cannot learn. And for this is not the only computer sciences. That require laboratory practice, exactly. Therefore, to increase the quality in online education, some actions need to be practiced.
every type of philosophy, right? about religion also. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. Very well, Kasha, on the board of Kasha, the board of Kasha, the board of Kasha, the board of uh, former Marshall Moore, the fellow representing the United States of the European Union on gender expansion, green technology, and financial matters today. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Masjid Al Tarame. I graduated from this school, North American University. <laughs> and I am here, here. And I'm from Jordan. And I'm working with KPISD right now. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Tawrakabe. I'm a professor. I teach accounting and finance and many uh, subjects in management. And I have been teaching with this university since 2016. And so far, I'm here. And I'm glad and I'm honored to be a part of this family. Thank you very much. Welcome to Montreal University. My name is Mustafa Bula. I'm an instructor in computer science. Uh, Amazing. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, this is Ibrahim Akusushke, an institution more than 10 years. I am serving as a chair in computer science. My name is Harun Yanmaz. Uh, I am teaching educational technology courses, and I am working since 2018. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Adil Tash, uh, the Department Chair of Education. I'm with the university about 10 years also. My background is uh, geography teaching, higher education. Uh, welcome and nice to see you all at the university. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> came out. Yes, yes, you can continue. continue. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shweta Shroff, and I'm the librarian at North American University for the last two years. Uh, I'm, uh, I have, I'm with me, I've, I'm bringing like 16 plus years of experience in public, academic, and special libraries. And I have about 10 papers published in national international conference proceedings. Um, thank you very much. I'm very glad I'm here today, and uh, I'm, I'm very honored to be a part of this esteemed organization. Thank okay. you. Okay, Kira. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Kirin. Uh, I am a visiting professor at the Computer Science Department. Welcome to our conference. Thank you. Just, just Good morning, everyone. Uh, you're all welcome. Uh, I'm the intending of students. I'm working for the for two years. Hello, my name is uh, Javed Lagari. I'm originally from Pakistan, living in Houston for the last three and in the U.S. for almost 20 plus years. And I, at heart, I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering, but then I moved on to administrative and political positions. So I've also served as the chairperson of the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan which is the equivalent of York in Turkey, and I've also served as a senator in the Pakistan parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Yasser Jabu. Uh, I teach at the university here part-time. I work full-time with MD Anderson. I have lived in Florida for 32 years, and I've been in Houston for the last two years. It's uh, There's no comparison, but I love the university here. I am glad that I am part of it. And uh, I think uh, the potential is uh, very high here. So I want to thank you for the opportunity and thank you for having me here. Thank you.
So I was just about to go there. I am Dr. Sabita Vidisi Singh, and I say doctor because I just got my doctorate. So um, <laughs> thank you. I, I joined the North American family in very late 2018 when my family moved from Malaysia to Houston. We had bounced around the world for the last 18 years. My husband is in oil and gas, and we had the privilege of living across multiple locations in the world. Um, North America has been home to me since I joined here, and it is part of my family. I've worked across a number of, of departments. I started with Dr. Travis as a part-time instructor, and you know her inspiration and leadership has just kept me so motivated. I later on joined Student Services with Dr. Taban and Mr. Yeldrum, and we, we, you know, our passion is the students, and we've just watched them grow and help them across you know, dealing with the pandemic. So for me, um, it has just been a pleasure working here um, in the different areas of touch student lives. At this point, it brings me immense pleasure to welcome our second speaker, Professor Mohammed Talib Obidat. And he's the president of Jadari University in Jordan and has been that in that position since September, 2019. He was the former Minister of Public Works and Housing from December 2009 to February 2011. He's a professor of civil engineering at Jordan University of Science and Technology and has been in that position from 1993. He received his BSc in, this, in civil engineering with, with honors from Yamuk University in Jordan. He also received his first MSc with honors in transportation and engineering from JUST in 1988. He joined the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, USA in 1990 and received both an MSc and PhD with honors in geomatics and computer vision in 1994. He was awarded the Laker Incorporated Fellowship from the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing in 1992. The, medical, the Medal of Research and Academic Achievement from His Majesty, the late King Hussein bin Talal of Jordan, 1997. What an accomplishment. And the Scientific Foundation of Hisham Hijwadi for Applied Science, 1998. His research interests include computer vision, GIS, transportation engineering, geomatics, and new technologies applicable for civil engineering. At this point, I'd like to welcome Professor Mohammed Talib Obidia to the forum. No, no, I, I don't know. It's about to do this. You just move it here. Yeah. No, take this one.
Therefore, I just want to deliver my speech. Since I've been here six days up to this moment, I'm leaving this afternoon, heading to my son to Detroit, Michigan. And I'm very happy that I see a mix of professors over here and some of the private sector people and even Jordanians, the, the head of Jordanian delegations over here, um, Jordanian and Arab Society, Mr. Ahmed Yassin just joined the conference. And, okay. and also, I'm very happy and delighted that I delivered a speech yesterday to the graduation ceremony of this university that I'm proud of. And right after this meeting, we will sign a memorandum of understanding with the North American University with His Excellency Dr. Sharif Takalan. That would be a sustainable and long lasting uh, agreement between Jadara University from Jordan, which is a private university, as well as North American University. Anyhow, <laughs> the topic of the conference before I just start, I, it is very hot topic nowadays. And before I start, I should thank from my deep beating heart, the committees that worked hard for this conference to be a reality. In fact, on the top of them, Dr. Takalan, Dr. Farouk Tabalan, Dr. Tawfiq, and the rest of the committee, in fact, and the members of the committee, as well as the members of the family of North American University. I feel over here at this university that we have a great diversity and internationalization, which gives an insight for a future perspective. I do love, in fact, and it would be a, a historical moment, in fact, in order to launch the programs of this university toward internationalization. That's why we have to hook with them and keep in touch with them to have an outreach responsibilities and possibilities as well for uh, the future to come. I don't want to talk that much. However, I just want to let you know that the pandemic COVID-19 was an international also, and it was a challenge for all the societies and the universities and everywhere, not medical only, because we have some medical professors over here, and my kids over here, there are two kids who are fighting COVID-19. In fact, one of them is a pulmonary and critical care a person who is medical doctor at Oregon nowadays. And the other one is in and Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. They are doing the same job. And, uh, you know, they were uh, fighting COVID-19 and making people healthy as well. That's fine. And the same thing, I have two kids also in Jordan who are having the same responsibilities. They are two medical doctors. And that's why we just want to let them know that life is a learning experience that we have to go, to go forward and move forward in order to uh, see it from the human perspective and see it from also helping and giving. It's very important rather than having and gaining. Gaining is not giving us anything sometimes. If you gain in order to survive, but if you give, you will lo have long-lasting uh, uh, attitude and people will at, at least remember you. Here in the States, I love something wherever I, uh, I go since 35 years, since I got my PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Everywhere you see, the, you have memories of such and such. You see also people are generous giving uh, for their hereafter, and they were also... Now I couldn't talk anywhere, by the way. My wife is coming and my daughter-in-law is coming also as well. That's why <laughs> I, feel, I feel that there is a conspiracy, a conspiracy that people came and asked them to come at this moment. <laughs> Anyhow, I want to introduce to, to my wife, the great woman that uh, produced four M MD professors. Uh, Hekmet Obedat. Hekmet Obedat. She's my wife and the only wife. I'm not looking for any word. <laughs> and that's my daughter-in-law. She is the wife of my elder son, 
دكتور بها هو از ان اوريجون اي تولد يو اباوت ذم كل مره عندي كريتيكال كير رايت ناو اند ام براود تو هاف ذم رايت ناو اوفر هير باي ذا واي دكتور لينا شي از ذا ذا سيستر اوف مستر مجد اولسو هو از هو از بين جراجويتد فروم نورث امريكان يونيفرستي اني هاو ويل جو باك اجين تو ذا ثينج ويتش وي ار كامينج اوفر تو تو بريزنت which is uh, uh, the presentation and the, the keynote speech that I will give over here in front of you. And as I told you, I'm very happy to have you over here in this regards. And uh, this uh, speech would be regarding the future of higher education, not on Jordan only, but also it would be for the, the, the nature as well. Uh, it's very important to know that uh, uh, we have a challenge everywhere, as I mentioned, a challenge Uh, for the COVID-19 and uh, the, the, the universities was not ready for that challenge. Therefore, how come we can change it into uh, opportunity? This is the, the big challenge that and the threat, in fact, that we are facing nowadays at the universities. Because of that, I will highlight some of the challenges that we had in higher education in Jordan during the COVID-19 pandemic. Number two, we'll talk about experience of Jordan universities in that uh, domain. And I will highlight to our successful story at Jadar University, how can we develop from face to face to online teaching system, which is, of course, we develop it by our employees at the university who didn't buy any model or anything else. And we just show you some statistics of e-learning that we had. And finally, we'll go to some decisions that the higher council of education and Jordan did for the sake of uh, changing the threat into opportunity, as we mentioned, and the same thing for the future of higher education systems all over in the Jordan and something else. Before I start, I have to tell you about our education system in Jordan. Our education system in Jordan is developing of uh, two different universities, different types. Uh, we had at the beginning the public universities and we have nowadays the private universities as well. We have almost about 30 universities. Among them, 10 of them would be public universities and 20 are private universities. The private university has been launched since about uh, uh, maybe 27 years from now. And uh, they are nowadays uh, booming in a way that it, it are make, people are making of it business and investment at the same time. Investment, of course, in human resources rather than in, in money-wise. So what we have, as you see, we have uh, 10 uh, public universities and 19 private universities, and we have almost 45 colleges in Jordan, maybe 50% or less than Texas uh, number of universities and schools. But Jordan, as you know, regardless of its uh, population, which is about 10 million, however, our investment always in human resources. That, that's the most important investment we do have because we don't have neither oil nor gold or anything else. The, we, the gold and, uh, and, uh, and the oil is the human being. That's it. Uh, that's why we have to invest in their higher educational system and, uh, and education in general at this domain. Uh, we also have different programs in Jordan. We have uh, almost about 90 PhD programs and 550 something uh, master degrees programs and about 1000 and plus uh, bachelor degrees and diplomas about 28 that is uh, that means we have a pyramid of uh, uh, its base consisting of bachelor degrees and uh, we nowadays not consist not focusing on uh, only uh, uh, the knowledge or the certificate We are focusing on the skills and the competitiveness wise wherever you go at any university. Uh, in general, we have almost 10,000 PhD holders at the universities in Jordan. And we have almost 2,000 and plus of master degrees holders. And all of them together, they are consisting of a community of, of PhD holders of more than maybe 50,000 PhD holders in Jordan because Jordan is uh, the epicenter, of course, of uh, higher education in the Middle East. That's why we just uh, uh, export many people who are going to the Gulf region and the neighborhood around to, for, to teach, to go to universities, to participate in the private and se sector, and you name it. We have number of students nowadays, almost about 400,000 students enrolled at, at, at the universities. Some of them are 
about 300,000 in bachelor level and about 30,000 in uh, postgraduates and 33,000 in diplomas. And the same thing uh, that we, uh, we have number of international students, about 35,000 international students from about 110 nationalities all over uh, uh, the world. Most of our universities are accredited, by the way. This is very important. Accredited in terms of local accreditation bodies and accredited in terms of also international bodies like uh, Times, QS, Shanghai, you name it. Mainly the public universities, they are, uh, uh, they are uh, accredited by Times and the QS and Shanghai. However, uh, the private universities are all of them accredited locally and some of them are accredited uh, uh, by, for example, QS or Times. Uh, then, about Jadara University, that's, I'm proud to be its president, which is located in the northern part of Jordan. And we name it uh, according to the Auditorium of Jadara, which is uh, an ancient and Roman place, Roman city, which is located in the north part of Jordan, as you see. Uh, and I encourage everybody to visit the site, uh, which is a very, uh, you know, demanding site. And people are coming from all over the world in order to uh, take a look, which is, of course, heading uh, uh, at a triangle between Jordan, Palestine, Syrian, uh, borders and uh, that's uh, the way which we have this is our university which is uh, consisting of about 250 acres and uh, about 70,000 meter square buildings uh, we have our own vision and mission of course of the university that is uh, going toward internationalization and working through teaching human uh, uh, resources related to uh, research and development, as well as innovation and community service uh, in our mission. Uh, during COVID-19, we had a lot of challenges, in fact, numerous challenges uh, that comes amidst a time which is a sudden time. We, where we, have, we had to have face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, teaching and suddenly we went to uh, switch off and switch on into a new methodology of teaching, which is the online teaching. We don't have platforms that we didn't have platforms at that time. Even we didn't train our people. Nobody knows anything about that. I remember I was traveling to Malaysia and I just hear about uh, the pandemic through the news that they're coming and we have different waves are coming. Then we suddenly set up a strategic plan and action plan that we have to develop. And uh, the challenges that we have to do are the followings. The timing is a problem. Uh, training its skills uh, to give it for human resources, whether they are faculty members or uh, administrative staff members or students as well. Uh, network environment. We didn't, we have to have Wi Fi and so on, and network uh, connections for computers. Platforms. We didn't have platforms also. Teaching and evaluation and exams, as Dr. Takalam mentioned. We don't have any platforms for the exams we need also to have a quality assurance that's the most important thing for uh, for uh, online teaching uh, campus out product we need the employees also to work how can they work and produce something while they are uh, far away from home jordan never have been you know having a challenge or facing this problem where we have people have to work from their homes never done it has it's it's nowadays common things working environment the working environment people are keeping you know connection uh, having problems with the connection of the internet and so it was a problem student counseling some of our students face a lot of challenges so we what how can we do for the counseling for them and many other problems in fact we have challenged and face along that time therefore in fact the challenges themselves on the broad also universities had many other issues we have on the uh, higher education system we have a challenge of legislation how can we also face a problem uh, that's we have we want to move from face to face into uh, uh, online teaching we need to change our legislation especially that we have uh, a law of defense that uh, that makes the army and the police controls everything by the way in Jordan that's and still working since the start of the pandemic as you know 
And among that, we have to go through civilian life. So it's a challenge, it's a big challenge. So, and then we have the teaching and learning environment as, well, as a challenge. Interaction between student and, in, and instructions, also instructors, sorry. Uh, uh, that was a problem, the human touches, the human, you know, the eye contact, the communication skills, uh, everything is, was a challenge by itself. The online environment and the suitable platform that we need, teaching methodologies and the quality assurance graduated for, for graduate students, training students, academic and staff for these systems, and interaction between different uh, university elements, among them the students, the, 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 uh, the instructors, the, uh, the administrative staff, and so on. Therefore, COVID-19 challenge, uh, it was a challenge for higher educational system and council as well as institutes and before because of that the higher council took the lead uh, in order to control all the universities for private and uh, public universities for example at jadara university we have to do the following and we did that for the first one we did the remed remedial measures for education and health the social distancing the uh, health protocol you name it then we have a teaching e-learning platform. We developed that platform within two weeks. And now it is nowadays competitive with Moodle and more. And we use also the Teams, uh, the Zoom, the uh, Google Meet, uh, you name it, for different activities, whether we are using that for uh, lecturing or, for example, for uh, workshops or conferences like this. Nowadays, we can do Last semester, for example, I did seven international conferences where we have participation of over than 15 countries for, for each conference. That was a challenge, a big challenge, and we get used to it nowadays, it's common. Uh, then we had training material, developed training material, videos and so for, uh, for students, bachelor degree and graduate students, as well as the, for the instructors. We have courses, course portfolios that we uploaded to the system for the whole courses at the university level. We did awareness campaign for social distance, distancing, sanitization, and so on. Counseling, we develop a counseling center, by the way. Nowadays, if you go to the internet and you can, you want to have to consult the counseling, we have seven different professors who are uh, a specialist in the counseling, through the counseling center. And we uh, have to develop a remote environment for all the university elements and virtual environment is working also uh, as well uh, we, we have also other challenges you don't believe it that we have we have eight different uh, faculties where which we have 61 percent of them are humanities and 39 percent is scientific there's a big difference to teach online courses for humanities and scientific courses there's a big difference and a challenge. Imagine that a professor of history nowadays is expert in online teaching. And even though he doesn't know English, they, are, they know Arabic only. Sometimes we have to develop the system and to cope with the system. The same thing for the male and female. We are happy that in Jordan, that male, uh, uh, normally they are more than uh, the female, female, more than male as a gender policy. And they are more clever, in fact, to be honest. 57% of them, they are enrolled at the universities and 43% uh, of the male are uh, at the university levels. You know, you know why? Because they just study hard and they, even though they are taking other responsibilities. That's, an, uh, of course, in front of my wife, I have to say that. No, I couldn't say my <laughs> I couldn't say anything else. Uh, You wouldn't believe also there was a challenge among the professors more than the assistant professors. Professors, they, they develop their own research work and they have everything, but they couldn't cope 100% with the e-learning platform. However, the assistant professors, they had better uh, performance in that domain. Even the age of the professor and the age of the, uh, of the uh, employees took into consideration. How can we move forward? Of course, we did a lot of, of remedial measures, as, as we mentioned, and actions in that regards through the Ministry of Higher Education uh, in Jordan and the Council as well. And we had six different axes that we have to develop and we have to 
be uh, enrolled within that and to have a successful experience in that domain. Uh, we have to integrate modern technology and encourage interaction learning and self-sustainability. Uh, uh, and we have to consider also the learning outcome of the disabilities of the people also who, are, who, who should take care of that, we should care, take care of them. So we have the six axes where the following, we have suggestion of technical institutional capacities, we have focus of suggested training, focus of academic programs and the proposed study plans, and we have uh, pedagogical uh, access type of e-learning and the proposed funding. We need funding for, for that particular uh, project. And that finally, we have to control the quality assurance. Of course, we did that all, and uh, uh, we have developed a, a, a platform regarding that in order to have e-learning system, whether it's synchronized or asynchronized, and uh, it is a ratio of two synchronized to one, or one to one. Uh, each university is uh, suggesting uh, the, the paradigm and the platform they want and uh, the protocol they want. And the same thing, we have other choice for blended learning, face-to-face uh, -face or online. And it's a ratio of two one or one one, uh, synchronized or unsynchronized for that particular look, uh, thing. And every university should report that to the Higher Education Council. The same thing, we have restructuring for the system. We have introduction of, of training models. And uh, uh, at the end, we have a full distance e-learning system, whether it's synchronized or asynchronized, and it should be divided for blended learning or online or face-to-face. Uh, -face. And nowadays, for example, for the summer session, in order to move for face-to-face -face at the beginning of the summer, next semester, just before I left Jordan, I took a decision, a dean's, a dean's decision, Dean's Council decision that at Jadar University, for example, will have 70% face-to-face at the beginning of the, the fall semester, and the 20% would be a blended learning, synchronized and asynchronized, and 10% would be a mix of, uh, of course, uh, what we call it hybrid system at that particular uh, type of system of e-learning which we are uh, doing. Uh, these are the system which we I just mentioned in that regards and the complete e-learning system uh, paradigm that I mentioned, and the models uh, for the blended learning I just mentioned uh, for the online or face-to-face -face or online one one or two one online and face-to-face uh, -face one and one online or two face-to-face, -face, which are three different scenarios that we have uh, to do. And the second axis would be for the study plans. We changed dramatically the study plan for the whole courses and for the whole departments and the programs that we have. And the third axis were, was regarding the uh, training axis where we have to launch programs for training of faculty members, uh, academic staff members, students, and uh, all the specialties for the staff members. And we already have the fourth axis regarding the legislation and the administrative structure and some responsibilities of learning. We already did that in this regards where we have to accept as a legislation and it has been launched for that legislation that we have to accept the e-learning system exactly as the face-to-face -face during the pandemic uh, time. Uh, then we had uh, the fifth act, which was about uh, 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 the, the institutional capacity uh, regarding the uh, availability of the PCs and so on and the environment of the teaching and the communication system between the faculty members and the students as well. Uh, then we had uh, the Wi-Fi environment, which is available nowadays at every university in Jordan, maybe in, in the States University, it's available all the time, but it wasn't the same case for Jordan University before the, the, the pandemic. And the sixth uh, pedagogical uh, axis was that we have a, either a full uh, uh, e-learning system or a blended or face-to-face -face system, as we mentioned, and we took the summer session for different ranges. We had numerous studies in this regards, uh, about the consistency of the work and the quality assurance of the work and the same thing for the domain and of the challenges uh, uh, that was done. The, the idea is that nowadays Jordan is, uh, all Jordan universities, whether they are private or public universities, they get used to the system of the distance learning, online learning, blended learning, uh, hybrid learning, and face-to-face -face at the same time. They, you can switch on and off. We couldn't use it only for the pandemic itself. 
we can use it also in the life to come future to come for different for any emergency case whether we have holiday whether we have extra courses extra uh, curriculums extra for example activities uh, lectures you need to give as a professor you could uh, do that uh, easily the training workshops which we had for uh, all the academic staff members and the students through that system that one of them for distance learning the other for, the other for the blended learning synchronized the synchronized flipped learning and so on the learning training workshops what was excellent and successful these are part of uh, uh, the uh, needs for example uh, in the middle east we need for example uh, online learning of about 50 percent and uh, the uh, type of uh, uh, visual aids that we need, for example, videos such and such, uh, radio such and such, TV only, uh, lecturing, uh, texting, uh, you name it, okay? And the same thing for simultaneous education. Uh, we had uh, virtual reality issues uh, for a synchronized issue, also the same thing. What kind of synchronized thing you can do? For example, you can send uh, for asynchronous emails, you can send, as you see, virtual uh, reality issues. Uh, we can uh, make forums, we can make uh, online as a percentage. It's clear nowadays for every institute and uh, the distance learning would be, as you see, it's a paradigm that we can use uh, through the website, educational platform, social uh, networking, uh, mobile uh, learning and so on. Uh, the idea is that we have a stand for the future of higher education and the stand looks clear as a plan for distance learning uh, and the blended learning as well as face-to-face uh, -face, it's a mix and online uh, learning in jadara the same thing we did as you see we have a procedure wise uh, where we have experienced COVID 19 in order to develop everything from scratch nowadays we have uh, the system of development of online we have the system of the training of, for the whole employees and the academic staff, as well as uh, uh, the administrative staff and the students. We have also the evaluation system, and we have also the quality assurance system. And every step we just mentioned has been uh, set up as an action plan. And we evaluated and we did a quality assurance test for that, which was successful by all means. That's why we just consider Jadara as uh, one of the successful stories in the domain of ch changing the challenge into opportunities for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, then we develop organization structure for Jadara University and the same thing for the infrastructure. We did everything for, uh, for the infrastructure. Every professor has a laptop nowadays. We have a Wi-Fi environment. We have launch, we launched the, the load and uploaded the, the courses. Uh, every professor is knowing nowadays how can he or she uh, develop a course curriculum, making the testing and so on. Uh, all the procedures for academic and the computerized system for students and faculty members are available. For example, this is an example I just want to show you for what happens in Jordan during the pandemic and before the pandemic. If you see before the pandemic, the, the activities, as you see, uh, for uh, here, the two, uh, 18 to 19, uh, it was less than 200K for the computer heads. However, during the pandemic, the 220, it's more than 1.2 million heads for Jadara, which was about maybe seven, eight times more than usage of computer networking and online teaching more than the one which we get used to, which is, of course, uh, a kind of revolution uh, in terms of technology and uh, digital uh, transformation, as we mentioned. The same thing uh, happened for the activities on the, on the, on the uh, level of uh, what of system you are using. Mainly people are using Android more than Windows because most of the students they do have cell phones and they work on that. And the iOS is uh, almost, uh, this is a, a kind of ad for the Android more than iOS. This is, a, of course, I don't mean that, but this is reality. Maybe Jordanians do, do have an Android systems more than iOS. I personally use iOS because my telephone is uh, uh, iPhone 11, that's why, for example. <laughs> uh, the same thing uh, for the rest of uh, different uh, applications and operational systems, even the timing 
for the year, for the month, and so on, has been recorded, and it is going up and down depending on the activities which we have uh, launched. And the same thing for the departments, even. As you see, some of the departments and colleges more, use it more than uh, the one which we had, which is the, uh, the number of courses in red and the number of e-learning courses. Most, as you see, uh, maybe above 97% of all of our courses are nowadays uh, taught in uh, e-learning environment. Uh, the same thing for uh, the last three days of colleges also is the same trend. And the distance teaching uh, is uh, successful. Uh, these are some of the activities, real activities, which I gave you through, uh, of course, uh, Jadara Education's e-learning system, uh, uh, where we have, uh, we use the Microsoft form, by the way, for the exams, and we use the teams for the teaching and the e-learning as well. And we have an educate where students can go through in order to uh, log in and having their information uh, directly and we have mobile applications for the systems of uh, students uh, academic staff members and staff members as well and uh, uh, some of the activities which we have different even the nowadays all the meetings we launch it through teams and our e-learning system no no need to come and sit like this in jordan uh, by law it's prohibited to have uh, a meeting more than 20 people nowadays because uh, and if everybody should put the mask by the way here, of course, uh, I personally took uh, a P Pfizer a long time ago, and my wife and my kids and so on. So basically, we get used to the U.S. environment like you exactly. And this is the first time I took off my uh, my mask, uh, even though since one and a half year I was putting it on and keeping the social distancing and so. But I wish that my uh, test, which would be done, uh, that uh, the, the PCR test would be done uh, this Friday, it would be negative. Otherwise, I will stay next to my wife for two weeks. That's why <laughs> she's staying with my son also for two weeks as well. Uh, okay. Procedure-wise, we had done everything for Jadara University, and we had workshops uh, for all of them, and we have evaluation testing. Uh, that the one which Dr. Takalan mentioned regarding the evaluation of the e-learning, we use. Uh, of course, the, the e intended e-learning outcome assessment program. Uh, we uh, have statistical e-learning systems also, and we uh, use it for graduation as well as uh, uh, research, uh, electronic exams, short exams, uh, uh, forming different communities. Uh, as you see, this is a percentage of the questionnaire of the evaluation. What is that satisfaction uh, percentage that students or uh, academic staff members agree upon uh, the system which we are doing. Our student agrees approximately 93% of them on average of our system. But at the very beginning of the system, when we launched it for an online system, it was about 57, by the way, 57%, which means that the feedback is excellent nowadays. And even students nowadays get used to the online system. They won't go to back to the face-to-face. -face. You know why? Because they had they have higher grades uh, when they get on the online. Of course, we don't know from where they get the grades. Nobody knows. They are cheating or they are doing it by themselves. We couldn't control that. We try our best, of course, to put the camera and not to move and not to leave. And then we did a lot of things regarding the exam evaluation. But finally, it is, uh, you know, the system that you can do uh, that's, uh, that application. Of course, we had developed many videos regarding uh, uh, the systems of uh, training and evaluation, as well as uh, uh, the, the legislations and quality assurance, uh, and uh, how to use the forms. We use the forms for exams and the teams and the e-learning system uh, regarding uh, the teaching and regarding the exams and evaluation. Uh, the same thing, we have a follow-up uh, of the technological procedures that we are doing, uh, the follow-up consisting of uh, numerous uh, procedures that sit forward in order to make sure that the quality assurance is 100% uh, done. Uh, we should know that the unemployment rate nowadays is booming in Jordan, which is very important to know that the online also reflects the, uh, an increase of the unemployment rate. We understand that. That's why it depends on the different sectors uh, that, are, uh, that are available 
whether we, uh, for example, get employed or not. This is very important because the employment rate of our graduates at Jadara University, for example, reached up to 40% last year. Maybe this year it will fall down due to the online teaching and because of the quality assurance issues. The same thing, what skills we need for the for the students, the skills that in order to compete in the labor market, to have relevance between the graduate, the, the, the higher graduate sector and the labor market, this is an, a, a very important issue that we have to take into consideration. In general, I just want to say that uh, online education nowadays, it's not an option, it's a must. It's a must because it, we have to switch on off anytime, any moment. Yesterday, my kid was about uh, to go to Oregon and his flight to Denver, Colorado, you know, changed to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. For what reason? Because of adverse weather conditions. It, something might happen like that, which means that we can have abnormal conditions any moment. That's why we need to have a legislation that requires the online teaching for, or accept at least the online teaching for the new era and the new millennium of the third, the, the third millennium, as we mentioned. And uh, we have to develop our own platforms. We have to develop, of course, uh, the training courses that we are uh, working on that environment. Uh, it, the, the, uh, of course, uh, we have to understand also that the online method uh, was uh, the best to be suited for everyone in, uh, in this working environment. And uh, it would be a popular very soon. And we are, sooner or later, we are having a digital transformation for the learning system. And then, uh, of course, uh, the new era that we are looking forward for our kids, uh, we have a well-known say in Arabic, says the following, teach your language for the time of not you are being, teach him or her for the future of that they will be, uh, which means that the new technologies, they should handle it and know it. Because of that, we see that the kid of two years old nowadays, he or she can play on the cellular phone and uh, the iPad and so on easily more than me and all of you. Uh, that means the future is booming toward electronics, booming toward tra digital transformation. And uh, we wish uh, uh, this conference uh, a very successful, of course, uh, outreach and uh, uh, results and recommendations to come in terms of connection, networking, and uh, in terms of uh, 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 conclusions. Thank you very much for your patient, for being patient, and uh, uh, thank you very much in advance for, uh, of course, being uh, with us uh, uh, in order to sign the memorandum of agreement between uh, Jadara University and North American University. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and I wish you uh, the very best uh, to, uh, for this conference. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor Mohammed. Once you joined us late to your family, uh, welcome. And um, to Ahmed, Alison, and also I forgot to, to say hello to Abdul Halim Yusuf and Amir Bulatov a short while ago. So. Um, hello, guys. As we move along the program now, I'd like to introduce Prasad Mavajuri, and he's the chairman and managing director of the University of Emerging Technologies. You had a brief introduction with him a short while ago. He's a senior business leader, entrepreneur, working for the past 23 years in the fields of business, process reengineering, business transformations, enterprise resource planning systems, business intelligence, business accounting systems, governance and compliance, strategic enterprise management, enterprise performance management, big data, artificial intelligence, ML, and familiarity in other emerging technologies. Extent he has extensive experience at plant level and business processes across the oil and gas sector with over 32 years of business experience in a broad spectrum of industries that includes telecommunications, high tech, steel, mines, power generation and distribution, petroleum and petrochemicals, healthcare, finance, banking, insurance, and public sector higher education. 
He has lived and worked in many countries and has a lot of diversity under his belt. Mr. Prasad Madhuri, Madhuri holds a master's in instrumentation engineering from the Antra University in, in India and a master's in business administration from Northwestern Kellogg. Welcome, Mr. Prasad. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good morning and good evening to all of you, wherever you are from. Thanks to North American University for giving me this opportunity to present. As I said, uh, jokes apart, I may not be, uh, you know, I may be the least educated person in the room, you know, uh, not having a doctorate up here. But uh, definitely, uh, I, you know, uh, what I bring to the table is the, the business angle of this and also the, the uh, effectiveness of education, especially in online education. So, so you know, at the end of the day, what, what happens is uh, this is an enterprise. You know, it needs to be fed with money and there is commerce involved in it. And we have to growth hack it. So growth hacking means, you know, there is definitely, we all feel that there is definitely an issue with the effectiveness of the education, especially. And then how do we growth hack it? And we improve the, the outcomes of education. So that's the whole uh, uh, thing that I'm talking about. As I said, you know, I worked in uh, you know many different uh, uh, engineering industries, you know, oil and gas, steel and mines, and everything. Uh, I'm very passionate about technologies. You know, myself, I did instrumentation, process control, computer engineering, what you call now. Uh, and uh, and then uh, I what what I also did is I'm also the chairman of a, a nonprofit called the Emerging Tech Foundation, you know, which actually focuses on uh, uh, role-based education. Because what, what happens is, you know, the, the, the traditional universities are doing great job in, in educating people uh, at, you know, you know, at four year level and all that, that. But what is the beyond that? How do you get how do you get into uh, the jobs? How do you how do you really use it? That's the whole idea that I'm actually. <laughs> OK, so then in that case, so when we go about it, you know, we have to understand, you know, the challenges of higher education. You know, and how can we solve it? And then, you know, from University of Emerging Technologies, what are we doing about? It? Okay, this is my theme of uh, today's uh, talk. And please uh, interrupt me if you want to anytime. But uh, but I, I hope it will be enjoyable. So the biggest problem we have is the affordability, right? You know, especially I'm talking this in 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 terms of uh, North American uh, universities and all that. See, if you look at it in the last, uh, in a, around 40 years, it has gone 260%, okay? And, and the student debt is growing. Uh, and then if you see the average cost, you know, if you're lucky, you go to a public university locally, and then, you know, it's okay, but otherwise, you know, it's going very high. This is average cost. In, in fact, this is, uh, you know, many top universities definitely are much more, uh, you know, higher than this. So why is this happening? Why is this happening? Is this is big? Is because the universities and colleges are becoming greedy? No, actually, they have real estate costs, they have faculty cost, administration, compliance, you name it, and and most importantly, sales and marketing. Okay, especially the educators are very good. You know, they they, they do a great job, they great service to the you know the world and nation in, in particular, but you know they're not the the sales people. They're not the marketing people. So sometimes it doesn't reach the right people and some and then the enterprise suffers you know in fact you know you're a private university you know you might be uh, i don't know how you're doing but a lot of public universities are suffering because they don't have money they have to cut off people they they hire poor teachers and they don't have teaching assistants so what happens finally the quality comes down and they are not able to I mean, most of them, you know, are not able to do a, a satisfactory job for themselves. You know, it's not that they don't want it, you know, but that's the that's the issue, right? So if you see the affordability, so how do we cope up with it? In fact, I, I wanted to show a, a video, but you know, it's fine. You know, I think. Uh, but the, the the idea is, if you look at it, you know, the the schedules, resources, and scaling, right? You know, keeping educators up to date. Okay, it's very difficult. You know, once you hire a professor, the professor is teaching and he has a curriculum set up and any change in set, you know, curriculum also has to go to the compliance people and it, it, it takes a long time. And then they are they really relevant with the industry? 
I, I'm afraid not. Because the, the emerging tech is growing exponentially. And that's the graph that I'm going to show, the job and skill gap. That we, you know, by, you know, Conferry has has projected that around, you know, 85 million jobs will be, you know, suffering because we don't have the people to skill matching. It's not that we don't have people who are, you know, studying engineering. It's that we don't have people who have the right skills. For example, there are three million cybersecurity jobs lying in open right now in the world. Three million, and we don't have people. Okay, and you know, we have so many people out there, and you know, there's a lot of lot of places you have higher uh, uh, in un unemployment rates, but actually, you know, uh, it's very difficult to match them. So what do we do? And you know, we'll talk about that. And then you know, qu finding quality resources to teach uh, uh, is also be becoming difficult because the, the technology is growing, as as a, a, a professor saying just now. And then um, and then of course, you know, the what, what about the people who are studying? You know, the, you know, if it takes a long time and they can't upgrade themselves, you know, it, we are not doing any service to them. So all these things are actually, you know, I don't have to read everything, but that's the problem, the schedules, the resources and scaling. That's that's the problem in the current system. And then so uh, also, you know, the, the, the schools are very traditional, very traditional. Right. And they they're very slow in, 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 in applying online. In fact, a couple of years back, you know, before the pandemic, oh, everybody said, no, 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 online is not that effective, not that effective. And then suddenly now everybody is, is jumping the bandwagon. And, you know, for example, even in healthcare, you know, I was I was part of a healthcare startup, you know, which was doing telehealth. And then oh, people said, no, we can't do this telehealth. But pandemic comes, things change. So the people are very resistant to change. OK, so now what I'm saying, for example, if you look at the University of Illinois, it started an online MBA and 134,000 students. And they reduced the price. It didn't cannibalize their, their existing programs, but exactly they, they achieved it. And imagine now, you know, Georgia Tech has started an MS at 7K. You may think that, you know, it is it is it is it is cheap, but look at the numbers. People want to study. So what we are missing is we are missing the opportunity for the universities and all for the students as well. Right. We need to change. OK. What is constant in this life is change. OK. So now and you know, similarly, you know, you have many colleges struggling to create. And one more problem, you know, the, again, I, I always, you know, applaud the universities and colleges and teachers, whoever you are. You, you're really creating a lot of uh, technologists, but they are not applied technology. Because I myself, I have a software services company. I hire a lot of people, you know, they don't know what to do. That means they don't have the practical skills to get into the job. The application knowledge that is, is what is missing. So the applied technologies is one thing that we have to focus on. And that is what we're trying to do. I, I'll talk to you about that. And then anyway, these are all the things I don't want to uh, um, read it out. But, you know, also one more thing. There is a big problem of educating the middle management and upper management, right? They have to understand because they they gone into the jobs, you know, quite a while back, and then you know, and then what happened is now the 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 technology has grown in exponential, right? They don't have a lot of education to encourage those people, the technologies, and and come up with that. So they need to be first educated up to the speed on an emerging tech, so that the whole train can move. Right. So there is a huge potential in especially in engineering and technology for executive education. That's another thing that I want to make a point. And then, OK, now what the challenges again, I know number of courses. People want a lot of courses. Are we able to provide? No, because, again, the same compliance problems and all that. And then, uh, as I said, the education institutions are not really uh, 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 the, the the marketing agencies. So they, they suffer from promotion, enrollment. Engagement, you know, I'll talk about the engagement next and the scaling pricing. If you if you see, you know, the bell curve, right? If you, if you reduce the price, the, 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 the area is more. And then you can do that, especially the emerging world, right? They need more affordable education. I mean, not only North America, I mean, because we are a global university. That's what I'm talking about. And revenue costs and resources and all that stuff. Right. So, in fact, I'm, I'm on the 
the board of their big data program in Rutgers, right, for example. And 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 uh, 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 they have the same problem. They don't have the resources. They had a big data program. It was going down. Then they called my friend. You know, he said, can you run it? Because they need relevant people. They need the relevant, you know, uh, uh, online experience. So we, we are running, and I've, I've been advising them for a long time, and and all that stuff. So this is a this is the deal, right? You know. So now, what are the solutions? So so basically, the solution is you have to have more industry relevant curriculum, and and democratize the curriculum. That means. You know, I was talking to the dean, uh, the president of uh, uh, American University of Paris the other day, and she says, Prasad, you're absolutely right. You know, you ask my head of uh, uh, computer science, the, gen the gentleman doesn't know what exactly is happening in, in the world right now, you know, especially in the computer science. You know, he's doing his best. But then, you know, something else is changing. Some Something else new has come. If you go to Apache, you know, every day there's, there's a lot of new code being generated, new technologies being generated. I, I would say that there is no technology that has not been invented yet. It's just that the application. Take Uber, for example. Uber is not a, a great you know, technology, but the sole process. Take anything for that reason. Okay, so there are few technological you know, uh, uh, breakthroughs, but most of that is rearranging the technology, you know, re reprocessing them. And then also, you know, as the uh, 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 professor said that, you know, hybrid learning online and on-site, you know, stackable, stackable courses. Give them quick and stack it, nano and micro degrees. That's what we want to focus on. And then real time, biggest problem, biggest problem is support. You get stuck in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a course, and what do you do? You give up. That's what I, 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 I joke with people. You know, the, if you run, you know, go by the numbers of Coursera's and, and, and Edureka's of the world, they would have educated the whole world three times by this time. But because there's so many courses there enrolling. But what is happening? A lot of people are dropping. They don't have support. So you have to have a support mechanism that's what we are providing anyway but that's that's very very key the support mechanism and then of course and one more th problem that we have seen especially the fresh graduates coming out of college they don't have personal skills they don't know how to behave in 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 a in a group setting they don't have minimum uh, project management skills okay they don't have the confidence to speak so personal skill is also very very important especially you know the people who, who are not very uh, uh, you know out outward or, or extroverts and women especially they need a lot of help they need this support they need the personal skill training you know a little bit of it not not much but then that sets them to a path the whole idea i would say is to be to create beyond education create opportunity be deployable so that's why we call you know university of emerging technology as technologies as a socially responsible commerce okay that's the whole idea okay anyway the industry orientation you know and, and all that stuff that we give so the opportunities of the school you know sorry my yeah. the thing is that you know, you know we we actually go and you know create more courses we white label it for you and then you can reduce the cost you know more courses and, and 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 continuous support you know for the people you know wherever you are and then you know continuing an executive education edutainment you know take the you know the senior guys the senior and middle level executives take them out put them in a resort someplace four days educate them right and then you know they get really bonded and and, and get get that's, a lot of <laughs> thank you yeah and because you know especially that happens in 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 the management you know right now education but why not in technology because they are the harbingers they are the gatekeepers of technology and they need to be educated first so that's what i'm saying and then have micro campuses across the field in fact i'm i'm, I'm talking to uh, uh my friend here and you know, maybe we will also have some uh, collaboration with uh, uh, in a North American university, hopefully, and we'll, we'll, we'll carry it over. But that's what the deal is. Okay. So now, uh, so what does what does UET do? So what you know, we have we've looked at it. The biggest need of the day is the short course, quick nano degrees, and then the macro degrees, the micro degrees. In a sense, you stack up. For example, if you if you take a, a, you know AI and ML. There are three different levels. You take them quickly and get into the job. 
And in cybersecurity, there are three, four levels. Even, even one or two levels, you definitely get a job. Of course, you need to have a little bit of a you know, basic education. But as long as you have it, these are the ones. And not only for the people who are getting in, in the colleges and universities, now you extend it to the schools, K-12. This is, you know, we have a, a program called Junior Varsity. And most importantly, this is not just, just taught as a, as, a, as a theoretical one. It is taught with a practical knowledge, a, a real project, so that they have done something application so that they get into the uh, market and get a job. And oh, by the way, and I'm going to uh, speak about it in a minute. So we have, uh, 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 of course, I'm also the chairman of a, a nonprofit called the Emerging Tech Foundation. So what we do is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a fiduciary organization to certify the this, this, this short certificates courses. Okay, so basically what we're trying to do is we're democratizing the curriculum, bringing the industry experts and making sure that 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 is relevant to them. It's not that what the teachers know, it is about what the industry wants. That's that's all. So it's more I would call as a demand driven education. Okay, so we're doing that. And then the upskilling is another one. And then where we are talking about the, the possible uh, 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 possible um, uh, partnership with the uh, NAU is that you know e e the learn in place your degree globally we can deliver any of the universities whoever is listening right now can can come in touch with us and all that stuff okay so these are the three things that we are trying to do one by one but this is this is what, this should be effective to get jobs because beyond education you have a responsibility to create economy okay so again what I say is the, our, our core principle, uh, our, our, the core principle is experiential learning. So you have to pick up a project, peel it down, build it up. Right. So this is experience, you know, bottom up and top down approach. And then what we are trying to do here is, you know, we are trying to give a role based education. It's not a Java programmer. It is a web developer, a role based one. OK. And then experiential learning. Learning by doing is, you know, it's the same way to put it in practitioner level skills. That means they can get into a job. Why not? And then live classes, we want to actually have a live interaction, you know, the classes, 24 seven live labs. You can, you know, depending on how much you want to spend, but there is live laboratories. We have integrated, we have built, as you said, we, we have built our own LMS. We built our own lab and we built something called i'm i'm I'm, com, I'm coming to that is called collaborative whiteboard you know you would see that uh, uh, and then you know industry orientation and so people can chat hey i got stuck here what do i do especially we have the labs concept is is very important because what we have done is this is called computer on the cloud people who have who have challenge to have a 12 gigabyte uh, in a computer and especially in the emerging world, it's very difficult to everybody to have a 12 gigabyte, you know, uh, computer. So what we do is we set up a lab. You use the lab. All you need is, uh, you know, just the connection there. Right. So that's the deal. And then people skills is, is a must, you know, I would say, but not only for the students, but everybody, you know, to how to interact and how to get on with the life and in, in especially in a job environment. So that's what we want to do. And then we want to bundle them into micro degrees. So the next thing that I want to talk about is the collaborative board. This is a, a, a unique board. I think we are the only one, you know, uh, uh, built it. That see, if you look at it, uh, you know, here, you know, you have, uh, you can, you can do everything that you have to. You know, you can pin a document. So let's say you're talking, talking about something here. Go refer to that document, and then uh, you can do all the stuff. You can write simultaneously. Ten people can write. Okay, and then you can actually annotate your audio. Oh, by the way, you know, you're speaking about the collaborative board at 12th minute and, you know, somebody can put it in annotation and you can save this board. You come back next next week in the, or, or any time that you want to resume, you can just resume it where you left from. OK, and then it's infinite canvas. So no problem. You don't miss your uh, boards. And then, uh, of course, real time collaboration, savable boards. And also what we're trying to do is this is in canvas now board over board. And now you can actually control the boards so that you can even administer a test. So you only give access to me to test. 
or uh, and to somebody else and somebody else and everybody has the same thing but nobody can see each other but that, that's also possible and then you know and uh, this is what is happening i think in lms arena we are the only one that you know has because this effectively increases education efficiency okay and also what we are trying to do on the on the on the other side is we are also extending this beyond just education you know to productivity like slack jira salesforce you can connect basically you can save the whole thing and put it in a ticket put it you know in salesforce on you know slack and all that stuff this is an integration with we have already integrated with the uh, google meet integrated with zoom integrated with a lot of a uh, lot of things right so uh, this is this is a, this is a beautiful product you know it's owned by me and another company but i'm giving it for free to the to the university and any other university whoever wants to use can definitely do that because this is the only one so the nearest product is charging you $14 per person per month so i want to drastically reduce because i really want to educate people okay drastically so that especially for the emerging world we want to give that right that's what the deal is okay so uh, and again you know all these things i just spoke about you know the if you partner with emerging technologies you know we market your thing you know your courses some of your courses you can be, you can white label our short courses executive education through us and then you can reduce your cost and increase efficiency and all that stuff that we can give so we, these are the revenues up and cost down you know which is which is the bottom line that you would have and then you know we want to make edu education more entertaining and enterprising okay and then and a hybrid model is also you know as i said it, it, it may be very boring just do the online education you know sometimes you want to come to the, you know the campus especially the third world countries you know or the emerging world i would call them you know if they want to come here they can do a lot of their education at home and then come for the essentials here in fact i am talking tomorrow i'm talking to the peter uh, your your dean you know from uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Urbana Champagne, you know, right? <laughs> I talk to you. So I'll, I'll say hi from you. Uh, so actually, I'm speaking to them. Please, please, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. And and uh, I'll give that. And uh, and this and and I'm, 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 we signed up with uh, Michigan State already. Uh, and we we stayed, we talked to you know another uh, international university and we, we are signing up with them and there are a couple of uh, uh, oil and gas ministries in the middle east they're talking to us because they want to uh, you know do that and also now we're getting into multilingual right basically and one more thing is that our model is uberized education we get the educators from the industry from the market who are already proven in the industry right so uberized education so my costs are down and i have a lot of rolodex that i can bring in you know, stuff to the the fore right that's what the deal is and and uh, and of course uh, students also enjoy the benefits you know all these things you know they they democratize and also democratize the academic calendar why not why should it be september to whatever you know june july why can't it be any time especially people who are already in 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 employment especially they, what do they do they want to study especially in 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 the emerging world or even north america you know the community colleges are not really doing that great a job in fact i'm i'm i'm, uh, I'm talking to the the whole 191 colleges in california right now you know so uh, you know they are uh, virtual college you know vice chancellor is on my board as well so absolutely you know we're going to do that and you know def you know the you you know that democratize the calendar and then make it more flexible give support people will get jobs and imagine now in in america in a recent uh, projection is we are going to have 6.5% growth in the next couple of years and usually we have only 2% growth we sustain very well okay now suddenly there will be huge huge you know a resource gap and and the whole sustainability is changing the world the whole online is changing the world you need a lot of people in emerging technologies and we need this right so so again uh, the the emerging tech foundation you know uh, i'm still the chairman and, and and managing but i might step down from the ceo position on that because it's you know it's a conflict of interest but uh, this this is uh, one uh, uh, you know which can actually give certifications on the short courses and executive education and i'm talking to the european union as well you know they they're looking at it right now so uh, again um, you know we have the quality and all that this is more 
about bragging about myself, but that's it. And and the Emerging Tech Foundation is another interesting one. You know, we, it's a self-imposed uh, 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 compliance that we have uh, said that you know they they, they they come and watch us, and there is a board uh, and all that stuff. And and the, we actually give students an opportunity to publish even a small article. Where would they publish otherwise? The small article, white papers, videos, and all that, and we are asking them to go and interview, you know, potential uh, employers so that employers get their marketing and these guys get some kind of, uh, uh, you know, familiarity with the people. It all works for everybody, hunky dory, right? And then, you know, we are we're creating the industrial community, and also the first time we are trying to create a tech radio very soon, you know, from this one. Tech radio is people don't have a lot of time. Uh, for a long news. So they want to know about who's getting funded, what is new, simply one minute news. Okay, nano and micro, one minute news or a micro bulletin is a five minute max. And it, it increases the marketing. Now, instead of saying so and so soap advertisement, now they say, hey, this news is brought by Microsoft because of blah, blah, blah. And it increases marketing for the radios and all that. We want to actually, you know, give it to people and all that. But anyway, so this is what the deal is. We want to evangelize, educate, empower, enlighten, and engage. And I welcome any university to come and partner with us so that we can deliver things. And we are very focused. We have a, a very solid. You can go and check the uh, uh, the university um, um, website. We got a solid. Uh, uh, our advisory board, where some of them are Royal Society members, even Purdue's, and uh, you know people, uh, you know Emily Riddle, you know Dean, everybody is there on that one, and you know we, you know we have an office in Lisbon, we have office in the Silicon Valley, and uh, and and in in the Silicon Valley of India as well. Okay, so um, yeah, this is uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. now for a couple of speakers now we are going to take uh, uh, this uh, the online uh, participants right now on the screen then i'm going to introduce our uh, next speaker uh, thank you very much uh, the president parasat mavarudi and uh, for your uh, excellent and very to the point uh, uh, speech now um, we have uh, i see uh, uh, dr musli dohoki here from iraq <laughs> the president of the Duhuki University. And we have uh, Sharzarbek Erdalato uh, from Kyrgyzstan, Alato University. And we have a uh, professor Farhat Nasrin uh, also uh, at IC. Do we have anybody else? Uh, Dr. Ranger? I think that's, okay, I think that's. Okay, so we have a video, oh, okay, we have, Professor Mani Lubis uh, from Jakarta, Indonesia. Hello, all, different part of the world. So wherever you are, so thank you. This uh, very unique uh, uh, city conference. So I would like to, uh, uh, you know, we are kind of uh, 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 delayed the program. So hopefully we are going to make it on time at the end. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Amana Lubis. Uh, uh, she's director of uh, uh, Sherry. Uh, Hidayatullah State Islamic University in Jakarta since 2019. And she got her undergraduate degree from English department at El Asar University, Cairo. She obtained her master's degree and doctorate from Sharif Hidayatullah State Islamic University, Jakarta. She graduated from the National Resilience Institute of Republic of Indonesia in 2012. She received a, a fellowship on women's studies at McGill University, Montreal, Canada in 1997 and 2006, she nationally won the prize as the second best researcher and author of PhD dissertation by the Minister of Religious Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. She's the author of many books and articles and member of many organization. Her major field of interest are Islamic history and civilization, Middle Eastern studies, Islamic political thoughts. So uh, the doctor, uh, uh, Lubis, this microphone is yours. It's a recording, right? Yes. Okay. 
So we will do the recording, uh, if you don't mind, uh, doctor, and then uh, we will get you on online for the uh, Q&A and your whatever you would like to get. And your mic is muted right now. Okay, let's do the recording now, please. It's about why higher education still needs offline learning while doing online learning. Such a little reflection. Actually, a digital literacy in Indonesia only covers 58% of the year. Fifties population, meaning blended learning would be unlikely to provide the equitable access and privileges to online learning, as the majority of the students and uh, education institutions still rely on the face-to-face method. This sudden shift would not uh, be easy for for them. So uh, uh, schools and uh, universities now is uh, sorry. Yeah. Schools and uh, uh, universities are closing now their campuses mainly indefinitely and suddenly being forced to transfer their learning online using free services like. Google Classroom and Zoom and burdening their students with heavy workloads and dubious results. Five significant barriers to online learning. Poor infrastructure, financial constraints, inadequate support, lack of e-learning knowledge and also uh, teacher resistance to change. And we need, of course, design and facilities of effective online lectures. There are four themes related to design and facilities of effective online lectures. Firstly, supporting student success. Secondly, providing clarity, clarity and relevance through content structure and presentation. Third, building a great sense of uh, foster a supportive learning community. Fourth, becoming more prepared and agile as educators. So faculties need to be prepared in all four areas of online teaching course design, course communication, time management, and uh, uh, technical. So now I'd like to uh, discuss uh, some uh, subject matters. With the sudden shift away from the classroom in many parts of the globe, some are wondering whether adoption of online learning will continue to persist the post pandemic and how such a shift would impact the worldwide education market. All universities and schools in Indonesia have responded by conducting online lectures by the bill from the Indonesian Minister of Education, Culture, Research and Technology, which encourages the implementation of the teaching and learning processes 
to be carried out uh, online. This online learning can prevent mass gatherings like uh, what happens in face-to-face -face lectures in classrooms. As uh, World, World Health Organization recommended that the prevention of COVID-19 transmission can be done by keeping a distance. Uh, how to increase the use of technology in life online learning? Uh, the implementation of online learning requires lectures and students to have the skills to use personal computer devices or laptops and smartphones in learning. Lectures also must adapt to the use of various learning management systems. Students require to use their own technological devices as the means of learning. In, in my university, for example, Sharif Hidayatullah State Islamic University, Jakarta, Indonesia, and the platform used for studying now, for learning and for the education process uh, is uh, like uh, this. We have uh, numbers in bars and in, uh, in statistics that uh, we have uh, 3,533 uh, students in total and uh, who are active in online class classes. Uh, there are 28,059 uh, 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 students. So, uh, more than 2,000 students, they are not active. That's because uh, they, are, uh, they, they finish their courses and they are uh, doing the research for the final, uh, uh, final research for the uh, graduation. Okay, and uh, we have also platforms uh, like uh, Google Classroom. Google Meet, Zoom, by email, Facebook, quizzes, uh, YouTube, uh, through e-learning, Edmodo, Realcom, etc. And we have also our official uh, website for academic information system. So we use also uh, this platform. And uh, what are the condition, conditions? of online learning. So teaching in an online learning environment, it means uh, from the structures to be facilitators in online teaching and learning. There are a change to pedagogy and teaching practices. Uh, what, are, what are the, the, thing, the changes? Uh, the changes is uh, uh, the instructor to have abilities and competencies uh, in six categories. First, pedagogic skills. Second, content skills, planning skills, technological skills, management and institutional skills, and also social and conversational skills. Uh, for example, in uh, online uh, education, by hybrid education, we use the offline and online. So we use the Edmodo-based e-learning in blended learning process. And it has been implemented by teachers of Islamic religious education at public vocational high schools in Jakarta. The Edmodo-based e-learning in the blended learning process succeeded in facilitating student participation in online discussions and assignments and to decrease student interest and motivation in improving their learning outcomes. Uh, and we come now to hybrid learning and hybrid uh, education uh, as for the character education or character uh, development. So uh, character education in hybrid learning 
can ensure moral difference. How is that? So uh, we have the uh, we should teach moral values through activities to develop emotional question uh, and other characteristics such as mercy, trustworthiness, connectedness, respect, empathy, uh, etc. So by hybrid learning, there are five I or E I model include. Uh, the five I model is initiative, interaction, independence, incentives, and improvements in this way are seen more effective. Um, yeah, so hybrid education to decrease the representation of multiple core integrity in good category. Yes, uh, in, in short, I'd like to have the conclusion of my paper. Yeah, uh, the conclusion is that uh, online learning has high prospect and uh, potential to be applied because it's closely related to technological developments and constantly changing anywhere fast and economical. Universities that are adaptive to changes in the Industrial uh, Revolution 4.0 carry out systematization of academic curricula, design policies for the development of disciplines, and study programs towards cyber universities with the support of lecturer resources who are professional, responsive, and able to conduct research breakouts. Technology-based education is an absolute necessity for success in the academic world in the 20th, uh, 21st century. Technology-based education is very important and has some social implications for individuals, societies, and nations. So what's the positive uh, social impact? of technology-based learning includes development of employable individuals, collaborative learning, improvement of research process, globalization, non-geographical limitations, and uh, increase the population of educated people. And the negative consequences of uh, technology-based education for the society, among others, uh, prolific, prolification, oh, sorry, proliferation of individuals involved in online fraud, insensitivity to human feelings, cyberbullying, digital divide, and also declining writing skills. Some efforts must be done to enhance the positive social impact technology-driven education and to mitigate the negative impact of technology-driven education. So, uh, finally, uh, I'd like to thank all of the audience and also the organizer. Uh, by God's will, we will meet after the pandemic, of course, and uh, uh, we will have exchange of experiences and ideas uh, face to face. Thank you very much. Be healthy and uh, uh, successful. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Amanda Lubis, uh, 
for uh, her quick, uh, quick remarks and uh, good coverage of what uh, has been going on. So is she here online? So to get uh, a few words uh, online also like a live, is she? So let's get to all the participants. Otherwise, we are going to go to uh, the next uh, next speaker. So, she, I mean, he's the, our uh, last speaker before the break. So, uh, okay, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Lubis, do you, do you hear us? Would you like to say a few words if you hear us? Okay, how about uh, Professor Erdolato? Are you online? Okay, I'm online. Okay, uh, Shanjar Begadolata is the professor, uh, is a current rector of Alato International University located in uh, Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, is one of the uh, Central Asia uh, the countries. Uh, uh, so, uh, doctor, so his floor is yours. I think you're gonna speak, so we have very limited time, so make sure, uh, yeah, you know, sure. 10 Thank minutes you. of your speech. Thank you. Go Thank ahead, please. Yes, uh, I want to uh, send my warm greetings from Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kyrgyz Republic, from the Central Asia. And uh, dear uh, professors, dear rectors, uh, thank you very much for giving a chance to uh, make a speech uh, for you. I wish I could be there on Houston, but for some reasons i couldn't come but uh, thank you for your uh, giving a time to demonstrate and uh, to show my actual the presentation so uh, there is a uh, uh, one my presentation but uh, if i just share uh, this presentation with you or uh, i can just uh, tell you in the quickest way and uh, let me just uh, tell you in a quickest way because of the time it's uh, already now a uh, uh, small time. Future of higher education in an online environment. If you know about the Kyrgyz Republic, it's located in Central Asia, and uh, Alato International University is located in Bishkek city, the, the capital city of the uh, Kyrgyz Republic. And uh, uh, Alato International University decided in May 2021 uh, stop looking at COVID-19 as a terrible problem, which it, it is. And uh, of course, we decided to view ourselves as being given an opportunity to reconsider how we connect students to education and what success would mean during, but far more importantly, after the COVID-19. Uh, the COVID-19 experience is typically reported by the university administrators from the perspective of the administrators, an impact on quality, impact on students, impact on operating budgets and at Alato International University in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. We have done, done the same. But the midst of the coronavirus trauma, uh, in assuming May 2021, Indeed, we midpoint in Central Asia. We attempted to reevaluate who we are and what we do, not how COVID-19 is affecting us. But in comparison with our ideal, or at least our preferred position, uh, uh, we can say that accordingly, we decided to stop uh, assessing how we were doing in the response in, to COVID-19 and instead use the stress and strain and uh, change the towards and deeper, more action-oriented focus on our stakeholders. As good academics and consistent with the good marketing practice also, we decided to uh, research methodologies, uh, elicit insights about the, out, uh, what our stakeholders thought about us and what we should be doing in the future. And our next step was to review all the research that we currently have on how our stakeholders view the quality and their level of satisfaction at Alato International University. 
And our conclusion was that we had to lead in research of too limited scope and quality, but we sought to harvest as much inside as possible that we could design effective serving methodology and content. And during the pandemic period, the Kyrgyz universities uh, were not ready to the uh, online education process, teaching and the learning. In this regard, uh, we uh, make a, we analyzed uh, this online survey and the semi-structured questionnaire was collected from the uh, 762 students from the two largest universities in Kyrgyzstan. So uh, we, uh, result of the research said that the Kyrgyz Republic were not prepared for the exclusively online learning rise in the online learning changes in context of the crisis caused by the pandemic. And the technical issues are the most important followed by the teachers, lack of the technical skills, and their teaching style improperly adapted to the online environment. However, the last place was assigned by students to the lack of the interaction with the teachers or poor communication with them. Based on these findings, research implications for the universities and the research are discussed. And our, uh, uh, we can say that Alato International University is one of the education organizations which has quickly adapted and decided to start online education while pandemic period started in March 16 in 2020. As you said, we have also the same system like uh, model system, and we use a Zoom, Big Blue Button, Google Meet, and other platforms. So we made a, uh, some questionnaires to the students and uh, how was the quality of education in at Alato University? And then most of the students said that they were satisfied with the quality of education because of the Zoom program and the equipments that we already both to our teaching staff and the camera and other equipment. So also we made in some questionnaire, as I said, and uh, recently we took also the accreditation, uh, the international accreditation is that we took is as an online uh, environment. And also one more thing is, uh, we opened the innovative educational technology it is that we opened the uh, the center with the Erasmus plus program and we made uh, some uh, webinars conferences online by using the zoom by using the uh, other platforms and it may, it means that we already uh, made an online connection with the uh, society, with the uh, other people. Also, we made a parents' meetings online by the Zoom program. And at the end, I want to just uh, say that uh, why we are using the online uh, platform, online learning, and uh, I think that it's the future of education. Why? Because of traditional education has changed radically of the year and uh, being physical present in a classroom is then is not only the learning anymore not with the rise of the internet and the new technologies nowadays you have access to quality education whenever and wherever you want as long as you have access to computer uh, we are now entering the new era and the era is the revolution of the online education the first one is that it's flexible. And uh, the second one, it offers the wide selection of the programs. And the third one is accessible. Online education enables you to teach from anywhere in the world, like I'm doing at the same time. So I couldn't participate offline, but I can participate online 
at this time. And the fourth one is it holds a customized learning experience. And the last one, it's more cost effective and traditional education. And the conclusion, uh, the, uh, I can make a conclude, and these are only the few reasons to choose an online education and why uh, ninety percent of the students today think that online learning is the same or better than the traditional classroom experience. Every student must assess their unique situation, decide according to their needs, goals, and which, uh, while this alternative to traditional education is not for everyone. It's still a convenient option with the virtually endless options for international students all over the world. So I can say that uh, uh, online education now, it's uh, quietly, we can say that um, useful and in the future, we hope that uh, the uh, online education will be uh, popular in the, uh, all around the world. Thank you very much for your uh, attention, and we hope that the next time we will see face to face and uh, communicate with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dulota. Just very, very, very warm welcome in this humid and hot uh, Houston, uh, uh, the, uh, the climate here. So uh, I see Dr. Dohoki still here. Thank you, uh, President Dohoki. Thank you very much. And I, I don't see uh, uh, Dr. Amani here, uh, Lubis. So, so we, we this is time uh, for a break, but we are gonna, since we are kind of behind, so I'm gonna make like about, uh, you know, uh, five minutes, but not more than 10 minutes break. But before that, we have new delegation uh, just arrived uh, a while ago uh, from El Salvador. Uh, so. Can you please introduce yourself to the delegation? We have a, uh, a translator also. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. We are from El Salvador, and my name is Jimmy Argana, and I am work in the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and Livestock and I'm very I'm very good and emotional to stay here with us and we are start to uh, we need to, to know more about your universities because we are in a new government and we want to uh, have a new relation in all of the ministries about all your universities. And so it's a great and I really appreciate the invitation, Mr. and everything here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to translate you in English and Turkish. In English. English. Mi nombre es Alexander Pérez, eh, represento y vengo acompañando a los funcionarios de, de El Salvador. Para nosotros es un gusto estar acá. It's a pleasure to meet you here. Y la verdad que es amistad de muchos años con el profesor. Muchas gracias por recibirme. Hello, hi, how are you? My name is Francia Silva. I'm from Salvador too. Uh, well, this is my pleasure to be here right now. And this is a really good opportunity for us. You know, our country right now is changing the government, like my partner said. Um, deputy right now of the assembly. And we want to make a new force for 
create, for creating uh, support for all people. So that's the reason we come here, that's the reason we appreciate this opportunity and want to do the best that we can for change. We want to do the best that we can for the old people who have the best opportunities. And now, here, this is the time. So, for example, I want to express a little bit about myself. Uh, I get the opportunity for the University of Franklin University in Ohio was something like this. Um, that was, uh, what do you say? The Escuelas de Negocios at uh, the Business School. And that's the way how I get the opportunity for the study. And I, and I understand this conference. This, um, conference. So I would like you give it to us that opportunity. And our department, La Paz, I represent them. We have a lot of students, they want it, but they can't because they don't have all the research. They don't have money. They don't have um, the high education, but we want to give it to them. So let it, leave it to us, the door opens. Why you work like that? Thank you so much. As we might have 11 years ago, our viewers in Turkey, they came. And then we visited also 10 years ago in Salvador. And this time I invited them. Unfortunately, the directors couldn't come, but it's young uh, people. Thanks to them. The first time we were together with Alexander in Salvador, we know everything in Salvador. Give me the present also. Thank you. Thank you to us and to come here and share with us. Thank you. Okay. Now, now is the time for like uh, about. 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes break. So we're gonna come back. We have great speakers online. So they are all over the world. And just, just a quick announcement with the uh, auspices of His Excellency Professor Blade that we are planning to have a joint conference next year about the, this time around. So uh, it's a tentative date, July 19 and 20, 2022. But before we can no, make- We might have to do it in winter. Winter. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a, Texas, Texas is a winter time. Winter time, okay. So, but it, it's uh, hopefully we will get all the speakers next uh, next year whenever we we do the next conference with the kind of university presidents face to face here in Houston and a more joyful, more uh, colorful meeting. So, thank you very much for the our online uh, uh, the uh, the delegation. Uh, stay online. So, uh, so we will be back like in in ten minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Computer Science Diploma, and he has a Bachelor in Business Computing, Master in Data Science, and Computer Science Engineer with three major, Business Intelligence, Software Engineering, and Systems and Network. For a Management Administration Diploma, we have a Bachelor of Business, Accounting Finance, 
uh, Bachelor of Logistics, Transport and International Trade, Master Digital Marketing, Master Project Management, Safety and Quality, and Master Financial Engineering. Since 2020, the global pandemic of COVID has generated the widest disruption of education systems in human history all over the world. Uh, the impact of this crisis is across the board and have affected learning process and teaching during the current academic year or even more in the coming days. So, in order uh, to uh, provide knowledge and limit the disruption of education during the coronavirus pandemic. Several efficient teaching strategies and relevant pedagogy were recommended by our university, uh, such as blended learning, synchronous and asynchronous learning, self-regulation skills, the quizzes active pedagogy, mind mapping, brainstorming, uh, student self-correcting, Progressive group tasks, business games, massive open online courses, online certification platform, online course platform, video lessons, case study, project based learning, online hackathon, and online uh, challenge. Let's uh, start with the blended learning. It is uh, learning that combines face to face teaching and online instruction easily with uh, leveraging the strengths of each. So the COVID pandemic has provided us with an opportunity to pave the way for introducing uh, digital learning. Actually, around the world, the pandemic of COVID has forced universities to make full use of a variety of emerging online communication platform technologies like Zoom, Viber, Presenter, uh, Google Meet. So uh, these uh, are uh, so these are um, our space in uh, the Google Classroom and uh, Microsoft Teams. Our university, our university uh, is among the organization that have invited teachers, students, authors, and uh, lecturers to make various online communication platforms to ensure uh, the education process remains unbroken. So including G Suite uh, platform for education and the Microsoft Teams platform. So as you can see here, uh, uh, some different courses uh, in our space to the classroom and Microsoft Teams. Many online training sessions were organized via this platform, such as online training for students to learn how to use a latex. It allows them to start creating beautiful documents for their reports, books, articles, etc. So one of the biggest advantages of using video lessons it is, uh, is uh, its ability to motivate students with authentic content. Uh, in some recorded interactive video lessons can be a powerful instructional research for increasing the flexibility of online education and for supporting remote learning. Uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, in order to strengthen our strategic parent, uh, partnership, many webinars are organi organized via online communication platforms. So, to motivate students, IT Business School focuses on several online certification platforms, including Coursera, Iraqi Academy, Cisco, ATC, uh, ATC, VM Education, Huawei ICT Academy. These uh, platforms give, uh, give uh, students access to academic courses with many supports for assessments like quizzes, exams. 
They enabled students to issue certificates after completing a specific course. Another efficient teaching uh, strategy was proposed by ITBS, the synchronous and asynchronous learning. So the synchronous learning is based on uh, live webinars, instant messaging, video conferencing, uh, virtual classroom, while the asynchronous learning is based on email, webinars, uh, learning management systems, and online discussion boards. To active the uh, so uh, to active the e-learning, uh, the teacher may uh, begin a session with a brainstorming by posing the questions or a problem, or by introducing a topic which is a large or small group activity that encourages students to focus on a topic and contribute the uh, to uh, the free. Uh, flow of ideas. So the brainstorming uh, allows learners to establish connections between ideas by analyzing and evaluating. Uh, the learning model is based also in, on uh, another efficient tool, the, map, the mind mapping, which is a, ver uh, a visual technique used to generate brainstorm ideas and come up with a solution concept. So this tool improves students' metacognitive skills. So learning by doing with business simulation games. Business games are a great way to bring active applied learning. So using business games in your course will give you the ability to better illustrate business concepts increase students' engagement and enjoyment, uh, improve student knowledge uh, retention, decision-making, and uh, teamwork skills. Active e-learning is an approach to instruction in which all students are asked to engage in the learning process. So these uh, teaching approaches range from short, simple activities like journal writing problem uh, solving and fair discussions to longer uh, involved activities like case studies, role players, and selective team-based learning. Moving now to MOOCs. So uh, MOOCs provide uh, MOOCs provide an affordable and flexible way to learn a new uh, skill, advance your career, and uh, deliver quality educational experience. For example, as we can see here, uh, so uh, one hour, um, so as we can see here, uh, our students have access to the books of uh, many certification platforms. Project-based learning is a teaching method in which students gain knowledge and skills by working uh, for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to uh, an authentic uh, engagement and a complex question, problem, or uh, challenge. In fact, so I choose the school organized some ch challenge. Uh, during the coronavirus uh, pandemic, such as a uh, hackathon called Hack for Corona via Microsoft, Microsoft Teams. Quizzes were used to uh, support our online teaching. Not only are quizzes fun for students, they are also a sneaky form uh, of learning as they don't feel like a traditional activity. In addition, uh, using a collaborative quizzes as a component of your teaching uh, techniques encourage students to uh, study harder so that they can help others succeed. Uh, one way to change the, 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 the pace in your classroom is to do a small group activity, progressive group task. This strategy is beneficial 
recognize a student, a class, a students, a class, and have a general discussion in which students share ideas or questions that arose within their subgroups. In sum, we are certainly that after this period of adaptation and of uh, of uh, students and uh, teachers with the online environment, the quality of the, the uh, educational process will improve and that students' uh, perception regarding online learning to be more positive. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Fenio. I just want to give you a little bit of background about Dr. Safa Fenio. She received a PhD in computer science and applied, applied to management from the High Institute of Management of Tunis, ISG. She's also a data scientist, a researcher at applied research in business relationships and economics at the High Institute of Management at Tunis. She's an author of several papers in international scientific conferences and she's a certified instructor in artificial intelligence from Huawei and the Oracle Academy. As we move on, we move into our next speaker, and there is a video that supports our next speaker, Professor Dr. Farhad Nazreen. Professor Dr. Nazreen is a full professor of history at Jamia Millia Islamia in New Delhi, India. She is also the director of the Center for Jawaharlal Nehru Studies of the University. Her writings have been published by national and international publication houses of repute like Rupa, Primus, Sage, and Bloomsbury. She has published six books and edited one. She's delivered a number of papers and, inv and was invited on talks in national and international seminars and conferences across many prestigious forums. Presently, she is researching the following themes to study history as a life coach using history for interfaith dialogue and peace building strategies. I now welcome Dr. Farhad Nazreen. I'm a professor of history and I'm here to talk to you about the online education and economics of knowledge and wisdom today. Now, uh, the online education really took off when we had the COVID-19, the pandemic that took over the world. In India, the arrival of the pandemic began in March, sometime in March that there was a uh, there was a kind of realization that we have this deadly infection coming into the country. I recall that it was in early March that I was teaching the Mughal history to my MA second year students, and we decided that we are going to go to Humayun school, who was the, uh, you know, the uh, second of the Mughal emperors, and we decided that we are going to take the cake there and we celebrate his birthday there. But as the news of the infections getting more and more common and more serious, we came down to an East Track that program. To begin with, we thought that this is just a postponement and maybe things will get better sooner. We can make other programs some other place, maybe. But that was not to happen. It was somewhere around late March that there was a realization that we have to begin taking classes on home because there was lockdown. Um, in the whole country, actually, uh, to uh, for the teachers, uh, it was a surprise because that was something that they had never done. Neither were the students the students make of teaching and learning. And uh, the university arranged for a program to 
the teachers to be trained into handling the various uh, online groups. So there was, you know, this uh, Google Meet, and then there was cross Zoom. And uh, for the students also, it was a difficult time because we were switching on to a space where we would not be meeting with each other at all. It was something new, it seemed strange, it seemed weird. And it seemed that suddenly we had just all ties had been snapped and we'd been completely disconnected with each other. The year 2020, as far as the classes are concerned, was in fact a difficult year because you find that a number of students were not used to this uh, way. Some of them were not well off enough to uh, have the devices to help them through this testing time. Some of them did not have enough you know, resources to handle their space at home, some uh, space, some quiet, some, you know, some area where they could sit down and take the classes and concentrate on. So it wasn't an easy exercise at all. It took some time for people to get into the mode of it, the hang of it. A number of students uh, could not actually do the classes because their parents lost jobs because of the pandemic or the businesses were shut down. So therefore they had to pitch in and see how they could contribute into economic activities and the you know uh, the earnings of the family. There were some people who were relatively better off but because the old and the vulnerable uh, population was uh, trying to avoid going out of the house. Therefore, these students had to take on, you know, the role of their parents out and start sitting in the shops, selling things in case of their parents. Some of them were running factories in cases of their fathers. So a lot of things did. Uh, another factor which was important was the gender divide, especially in the developing societies. Uh, there is a gender divide and often it is uh, kind of assumed and it is not so important after all for girls to continue with their studies. Now, as soon as the pandemic started, this uh, factor began picking up. And therefore, there was a possibility that people felt that maybe they would make some arrangement for their sons to have a device, have a laptop or a smartphone so that they could do classes. But it wasn't necessary for the girls to continue their education in this particular time. Luckily, the government of India took care of this and they started making, you know, uh, surveys to ensure that the girls continue to get education through their surveys. Data was collected from all the universities, uh, which mentioned that what is the uh, what is the number of girls who are taking classes and what is the number of boys who are actually attending classes in the one time you know, so that. There was a surety that uh, the exams will be held only if there was a substantial number of girls who would be able to manage their studies in the course of the pandemic. Luckily, there was a substantial number. So we did have an open book examination. The open book examination had its own challenges because in the first post, some of the people were not able to upload their scripts. Uh, for the examiners to have a look at them. So there was an alternate arrangement that they could mail their scripts directly to the examiners uh, instead of uh, uploading them into the examination branches portal. So there was a confusion, a bit of a confusion around that. But not, uh, uh, but still, all in all, the exams were very well managed, extremely well managed, given the fact that this was a completely new thing that we were doing for the first time. Some of the students who uh, stay in remote areas that we uh, you know, the internet people particularly slow, there was an issue with electricity, they found it very, very challenging because they had to travel to other cities where the situation was not so bad to appear even in the online open book examinations. Another issue which came up was that you know ensuring that there had been no cheating in the uh, you know in the open examination that people have actually uploaded whatever they have written at that point in time. So even uh, that was quite a challenge in kind of you know to ensure that there is fairness in the system of evaluation, even though we have a lot of limitations in the online system. 
Now, uh, as far as 2020 is concerned, most of it went into grappling with whatever was happening. And in 2021, when we began with the new semester in January, we found that the students who had come in the first semester of LA were better prepared to handle the online teaching. And the kind of despair and you know, kind of sadness that you saw in these students of the 2020 batch was not there in the 2021 because they had adapted to uh, the new scenario and they were prepared to uh, you know accept uh, what was there for them so they were they were more grateful for what they had and they were looking forward to making the most of it but we find that a large portion of the 2020 year went uh, based in just trying over what had happened and trying to understand and figure out that what uh, Later. However, in 2021, there was a realization that uh, if we need to make the most of whatever we have, we should take this as an opportunity to connect with people who are in distant uh, regions, people, uh, scholars, uh, academics, whom we could not have invited perhaps to our own country for delivering one of talks, the sheer cost of it might have been a lot. But now since we have the online mode, it was an opportunity for us to invite people from very, very distant areas and listen to them and their ideas. So uh, there was, you know, there was always something new to learn, no matter how difficult the situation was. For the 2021 batch, when they were to write this, their assignments, I took a survey from them to see what is the kind of problems that they face and what is their opinion about them and what they are handling. Um, it, a large number of them spoke about the connectivity issue. Uh, a lot of them living in smaller towns where electricity is not steady, the internet connection is not steady, those who think that you're in trouble again, the internet, uh, internet, uh, internet speed is not uh, high enough then it takes ages for the page to download. They have to download large number of books. Some of them felt that uh, it wasn't too easy to do that. People who came from um, economically weaker backgrounds were more troubled, certainly, because uh, if they had to work on the phone when the screen is really tiny and it became really difficult for them to read on that screen. In fact, in the survey that I did, there were a number of students who actually spoke about you know the the way their eyes were getting strained because of staring at the screen uh, at the screen for many many hours and reading everything online was not easy for everybody. Uh, some of them felt that they were so much used to writing notes in the margins of books and having a number of hard copies lying all around them so they missed all of that a number of them felt that in the libraries provided a better working space because there was no disturbance, there was no sound. But the devices that they were using now, whether it was a computer or whether it was a phone, the devices themselves were laden with a lot of distractions because they offered a lot of distractions. So um, that is one thing. But And for some of them, even if they were able to kind of, you know, uh, uh, get past the distraction of the devices, uh, there might have been disturbance in their house because you know, there, there are people who are living in small houses, large number of family members, there are inside homes, so people walking in and out of the room by their glass. In fact, that deterred them from opening their camera because they not open their camera to the glass. So um, it was all in all a challenge for them. The other interesting thing was that a number of students who were who were you know, kind of wanting in confidence when they were uh, when they were to speak in the class or have a face-to-face -face interaction. In the online scenario, I felt that uh, a lot of the, them actually became more confident. So because their physical appearance did not matter anymore. Perhaps the, the price of their clothes or the way they were turned out didn't matter anymore because they were not visible. So or even if they were visible, they were just tiny specks on the screen. 
and for, for some of them it was demoralizing, but for some of them uh, they became more confident and they were kind of you know uh, happier in this mode of functioning. Another thing which uh, we, which the uh, you know, students felt was a bright side was that they were able to spend time with their families after that they had done in the state of the hospital. But on the other hand, the equalizing factor that the university's campus offers to the students in terms of having access to the same kind of study material, same kind of things, the same kind of food, same kind of academic environment, that was not there. So there were disparities which came into play. So for them, for some of them, it might need to be advantages, but so for some, it might be uh, a really good thing. The disparity with their peers because of you know uh, because of their own um, economic situation and this in fact reminds me of the of the poverty trap and how there is a spiraling effect of poverty which takes you further down and as far as education is concerned I mean there is no doubt about it that education can power so if there are limitations set to the basics which are required for acquiring knowledge, then certainly the chances of those who are disadvantaged will become much lesser to have employability. Because the number of skills which improve the person's chances of getting an employment, uh, those, those, that exposure, in fact, would be got reduced because of the online. Uh, like for an example, a number of students who came to me, you know, uh, from some backgrounds that they were not very diverse with English, they were not much of a good English, but then they come to me that they were all these things to start to, you know, uh, advanced institutions of learning. They end up in a space where uh, they get to learn a new language, not just English, maybe any other language that they want to learn. There are many options. Especially, you know, because there, there are social uh, engagements and there are social interactions with their peers who might be very good at some other language. They get to learn about so many cultures, so many different kind of value systems. All those interactions became absolutely zero because there is no social interaction. So, so all those things are to be there this time. The um, Silver lining is this that human beings are cut out to be resilient. They don't give up easily. They will always try to find a way out. They are people who can unlearn uh, uh, human beings being the most intelligent of all the species, being at the top of the food chain. Um, they always look for you know ways to survive. And uh, as we see it. The online mode of teaching and the you know the people who are associated with academic industry are certainly looking for uh, alternatives. And given that the world of academics has some of the best minds in the world, um, I'm sure that um, they will be found. However, some of the answers of bringing social justice into education by in the economic betterment of all the sections of the society. That is very, very important. You have the economic support. Um, because if that is lacking, then it will be very difficult for, uh, for educators to impart education in the online mode because uh, a, a number of factors come in. Okay? When you are studying from home, because the equalization which used to happen automatically uh, by living in a common campus is not there. So having said that, I feel that there is a lot of hope um, in that in 2021 and in the coming years. Uh, we will learn new things, new modes of connection, new ways of interacting with people in distant areas because of what the pandemic did to the world. However, we will again rebuild once things become better and you know, we have education, better vaccination, and we can show the vaccine. We now have a way of going back to the times when we see each other's patients and patients with the
enjoy smiles. We could uh, give a talk freely in a one-to-one -one classroom environment and grapple how the lecture is going in a second by looking at the faces of the students. We don't know whether the lecture is being successful. So I think somehow um, there is hope. There is hope from the wisdom and the knowledge that humans already have that a way will be found. And uh, certainly the teachers and the students are administrators and the humanitarians together. When we find a way through this as well, then voila, we'll have a great time learning together. Thank you so much. Professor Dr. Rosanna Silva, who is the Executive Director of the International Cooperation Group of Brazilian Universities since 2008. She's an Associate Researcher at the Faculty of Psychology and Education Sciences of the University of Geneva, Switzerland, and an ex-president of the Governing Council of the UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean. Silva holds a doctorate in education from the University of Campinas, Unicamp, 1997. She's completed her postdoctoral studies in education sciences at the Université Paris 80, No. 8 in France. She retired as a professor at the University of Brasilia, UNB, in 2016. For her work in favor of international university cooperation, she received in 2018 the annual award of Brazil, Turkey, Cultural Center. And in 2019, she was declared an illustrious guest of the city of Ambato, Ecuador, by the autonomous decentralized government municipality of Ambato. She's the author of articles and book chapters on higher education. She's a member of the scientific committee of the scientific journal KASNU from Kazakhstan. Professor Rosanna was also a speaker at various international events on the subject of interna internationalization of higher education in over 20 countries. Since 1997, she has managed funds from public and private institutions and international organizations to carry out programs that involve a large number of participants and ma managers. Welcome, Professor Dr. Rosanna Silva. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank a special Dr. Sharif Dekalan and the, all his team for this invitation and the congratulations of all of, of, all, of you, all of you for this important initiative to organize this event. I would like to share my presentation with you. Just a minute, please. Could you see my presentation? Yes, yes. Yes, yeah? okay. So, and to talk about this uh, subject, I would like to say some words regarding the context. Uh, I believe that the subject of the future of higher education needs to be contextualized, especially if we consider this moment lived by humanity and since the first semester of 2020 and the, when we have the serious health crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, which, as we know, impacts in all sectors of life in society and this market consequences for higher education uh, worldwide. To understand the, the crisis, it is very important to consider that the different socioeconomic and the political context react and found diverse alternatives for the catastrophe caused by the pandemic. In addition, in addition, in the context of higher education, 
response to the crisis occurred at different rates and with distinct capacities to meet the demands of the academic environment, especially those related to the undergraduate students. With regard to teaching, it's possible to observe that while as some higher education institutions uh, quickly adapted their classes to the virtual format. It took months for other institutions to readjust to this modality. It happened, for instance, in all Latin America and the Caribbean. In this context, it is duly noted that millions of students around the world do not have the minimum conditions to face the new reality without quality access to the internet and also adequate equipment with the loss of jobs and the, the need to support their families, men were forced to abandon or postpone the dream of higher education diploma. All of these express the urgency to reinvent this institution, the higher education institution, and the restructure then to adapt the higher education institution to the new social demands. Furthermore, other dimension that underlie higher education, such as research, relationship with society, management, internship in the international cooperation, have not yet received the necessary changes in their actions, plans, and the strategies to guarantee relatively normal continuity or even closer to what was known before the COVID-19 pandemic. Thinking about the future of higher education in the online environment implies consider all these dimensions, dimensions, not just teaching, but also in addition, there is an urgent need to review policies that guarantee quality with equal right for all students in higher education. And the UNESCO has called an independent international commission to develop a global report on the future of the education. And now I will talk some about uh, some important initiatives in, in these issues. This commission will focus on rethink the role of education, learning and knowledge in light of tremendous challenges and the opportunities of the predictably possible and the preferred futures. The mandate of this international commission of the futures of the education is to collectively reflect on how education might need to be rethought in a world of increasing complexity, uncertainty, and the precarity. A global initiative to reimagine how knowledge and learning can shape the future of humanity and the planet. In the main idea is thinking together so we can act together to make the futures we want. The future of higher education it depends on collective response to face a global challenge. And I think in this moment we can realize it perfectly. On May, 25, 2021, the report Thinking Higher and Beyond Perspective on the Futures of Higher Education to 2050 was launched at a virtual meeting and attracting over uh, 500 attendees. The report is the result of a collective and creative process of discussion around uh, the role of higher education globally. Uh, two questions guide this work. Uh, how? How would you like higher education to be in 2050? And how could higher education contribute to better futures for all in 2050? 
um, we uh, highlight some um, some questions and some important information regarding these uh, reports. For instance, the future very such as respect, empathy, equality, and solidarity should be at the core of future higher education institutions and their missions. Higher education can be shaped as a public good and as a driver of social and economic development of countries and regions. Demo the, to democratize digitalization, higher education actors should be advocated for the right to co connect it, connectivity to a device and to networking, for instance, through learning hubs. Higher education institutions should be at the forefront of tackling the climate crisis and other global challenges through knowledge production and technology incubation and transfer and the integrated climate change education into learning. Frame it in the UNESCO Futures of Education Initiative, the report also highlighted four key messages for higher education toward 2050. To take active responsibility in the development of the potential of all humans, to promote well-being and sustainability orientated towards justice, solidarity, and human rights, to draw strength for interculturality and diversity, respecting cultures and identities, and creating spaces for dialogue. Finally, to create and uphold interconnectedness, forging collaborations between local and the global communities, and in bonding higher education with other levels of the education, including non-formal and the informal learning. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown the enhancing need for global cooperation in research, innovation, and the enhancing scientific, scientific capacities. Response, responses to global challenges such as these will be at the heart of future international cooperation, underpinned by values of integrity and the equitable access that should be also reflected in how higher education institutions are led and governed. So we can see that uh, today, more than before, more than ever, the cooperation the international cooperation among the right education institutions, it's very important. To strengthen the whole of right education, a more human right education for all is needed to include more of the most vulnerable and the traditionally excluded groups, such as out of scholars, human, women, unemployed, youth and persons with disabilities indigenous communities in accordance with the broader objective to leave no one behind. So this is some is very important remarks uh, made for the experts that work in this important report, to, pro, to publish this important report. Right education needs to be more responsive to diversity attracting indigenous, indigenous learners, ethnic minor, minorities, refugees, and or from underserved groups to create spaces uh, for dialogue. After COVID-19, higher education institutes should work to reduce the digital divide to ensure that the integration of technologies into education is well supported by access to the internet and devices and the support to staff. The right education on the future must be based on the formation of values. For instance, respect, solidarity, equality, tolerance, empathy, Environment, environmental uh, responsibilities. The key message has been blended into four broad statements on the futures of higher education. 
The first one is take the active responsibility for our common humanity, opens up and develops the potential of all humans, grapples with risk and bridges divides across times, people and places, but he also advocates for knowledge and the ways of knowing as a global common good. Promotes well-being and sustainability, orients toward justice, solidarity, and human rights. Supports a life project that stretches individuals, their families, communities, and humanity. Act and is organizing sustainability, ethically and responsi responsibly. The third one draws strength from intercultural and epistemic diversity. Respect cultures and the identities, wherever collective, institutional, or personal spaces for reflections and dialogue. Makes comparisons in good faith without imposing or implying homogeneity. And the, the fourth one upholds and creates interconnected and multiple levels forges collaborations between peoples, groups, local and the global communities, sustain bonds between higher education level of education, formal, non-formal and informal learning, relates humans, use other humans, not humans, the earth and the universe. And the, to finish, I have final comments. Um, considering this context that uh, we face in, in 2020-2021, we believe that we uh, realize that the teachers uh, have facing a lot of problems. The institutions facing a lot of problems. Teachers without enough knowledge to deal with the virtual environment. Students without access to quality internet, without compatible equipment, and without financial conditions to acquire them. Institutions unprepared to face financial and technological difficulties and not knowing how to deal with the difficulties of students, teachers, and technicians. Many students, in consequence, left the cities where they lived to start and returned to their family's home. Millions of students around the world have left higher education to work and help their families. Millions lost their jobs and they also had to give up their dream of getting a degree. Step by step, we know higher education institutions have joined the online activities, but this still occurs in a very uneven way. Think about the future of higher education in virtual environment require us to be clear that the world is full of inequalities that the people do not have the same condition, that the millions of students work to ensure the possibility of entering and stay at the university. For this, an effort to serve the most vulnerable group in all institutional segments will be needed. In turn, ensuring the quality of future actions developed by higher education institutions, especially in the virtual envi environment, we require investment in technologies, qualification of all its professionals, faculty and staff, and the students of course of all levels. The planning capacity to adapt to future crisis contexts will become imperative in this scenario. It is clear that we cannot predict the future of the world much less the future of higher education. But we have the responsibility to plan the present with the expectation of having a better world, more egalitarian, more sustainable, and where justice and peace prevail. For this, it is very important to think far ahead, far beyond what we've thought so far. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Rosanna Silva. As we move along the proceedings, I'd like to invite Dr. Nadia Mangeval. Dr. Nadia Mangeval Moran is the General Director of the Graduate School at Universidad Evangelica de El Salvador since 2015. She's a doctor in dental surgery and master in public health. She has been working at Universidad Evangelica in management and undergraduate dental programs, as well as graduate master programs. She's also an independent consultant for the design of educational or research programs and health. Dr. Nadia was an assistant dean for the dental school and dental clinics director between 2005 and 2015. Welcome, Dr. Nadia Mangeval. Thank you. It is a pleasure to share with you, with the audience, the Salvador's experience in managing higher education programs under pandemic. First, I want you to know my country. El Salvador is a developing country located in Central America. We are the smallest country of the region. Our territory is 8,124 miles. Our population is mostly young. 51% is under 30 years of age. The access to higher education in El Salvador is limited to 15.8%. Graduates with master's degrees represent only 28% and only 2.28% have reached a PhD degree. Inequity to access education has widened during the pandemic, since the only way to access education is through internet. Before the pandemic, only 36% of cyberwarians had access to the internet. Only 10% has increased in the recent year. In this context is where Universidad Evangelica operates. We are located in the city of San Salvador, in the north uh, area of the city. We are a private and non-profit university, which began operating three years ago in a very difficult context, as many of you may know of civil war. We have now 6,000 students in 29 programs. We stand out in the country for certifying healthcare professionals. Many of them are physicians, nurses, dentists, nutritionists, and others. How we entered in this emergency remote teaching? The university had a strategic planning, as many other universities do. We had a plan to increase the number of careers that were online or uh, blended learning. We started certifying teachers for basic skills in online tutoring since 2011 and officially started the first online undergraduate and graduate degrees by 2017. We have another platform and adopted the Ivy model for virtual teaching. 
In February 2020, we had certified almost 17% of the staff and had five online programs successfully run. We had reached our goals by that time. Besides, we had over 24 programs in the traditional face-to-face -face teaching model. By that time, we were uh, reaching all of our goals. But what changed our plans? And those probably too. COVID-19. As the state of emergency caused by the pandemic advanced globally, all of us educational institutions were fully or partially closed. El Salvador was no exception for that mandatory quarantine. For us, it was established on March 12. Immediately, at the speed that no one predicted, 684 classes were transferred online to continue teaching in 29 programs, including 13 bachelor degrees, two medical programs, two engineering degrees, five master degrees, two medical specializations, five technical diplomas, and all continuous education courses. It was the highest challenge that we have to face as managers. In this process, of course, we also have to face and solve many problems with the students and teachers. Students' resistance for online education. And also teachers' frustration on facing an extremely time-consuming new teaching model with many technical challenges that they didn't have before. In addition to this, we were all living the stress of unknown disease, the doubts to continue or quit studying, the fears of unemployment, and as the weeks went by, we also had to suffer the mourning for the loss of our friends or family members caused by the virus. This process that we all globally had to deal with, that was unplanned, and that in which we had to transfer all our education online from one day to the other, it is known now as an emergency remote education. It is valid even though many of the circumstances were not completely perfect for online environment. The specific actions that Universidad Evangelica in these conditions applied were we hired technical specialists to support and monitor our teachers, to give them the time to develop their own technical skills and to feel confident in the synchronous work, and also to learn to connect efficiently for live synchronous classes. This role of this specialist was called emergency virtual monitor. We had to hire eight technicians for this period. They are still working with us for this time. As a second action, we also added live online weekly classes, connecting teachers and students in the same schedules they did when they were in a face-to-face -face program. This was a primary suggestion and a need that they expressed teachers and students in an effort to look forward to fulfill the lack of interaction in this new learning environment, 
the mood interaction. The third option was to open new ways to communicate with the staff, with the students, to ensure that they understood all the new guidelines and that they had the space so we could listen to their suggestions in this process and all the improvements could be applied. And the fourth is that we kept administering the student satisfaction perception survey. We have this uh, evaluation, this assessment is permanent in the university, and we um, apply this measurement every eight to ten weeks. But also, we socialize the results immediately with teachers, so we could have um, the improvements on time. All of these efforts had to be measured. We needed to see all the information, the results, in order to take manage management decisions. So, in a case specifically for the graduate school in which I am responsible for, I will share with you the results in the satisfaction uh, survey of the student from five master degrees. These masters include family law, public health, human resources, research methods, and the Master in Epidemiology. We can see the results from the years 2018 to 2021. Our average, or the goal that we need to, to reach is 80. Before pandemic, in some of the master degrees, we had to make improvements in the satisfaction. But if you can see that we had an increase in 2019 before the pandemic, and the decrease that we had for 2020 was not significant considering all the challenges that we have that has been described before. Considering the teachers, the students were in parallel learning new skills in online environment and also learning academic abilities and academic contents and the student satisfaction almost maintained as normal as without the pandemic, for us, it was a successful result. All the efforts of keeping in communication, of having the technical support, for us, gave very good results. And if you can see in the yellow bar that represents the results for the last measurement, in March 2021, it represents the highest satisfaction perception from students in all programs. And this is right after one year of education under pandemic. What the results tells us is that all of us, teachers and students, have finally learned in their online environment. We have all together developed new skills and we have improved the teaching learning process in a new environment. This is completely successful results for us as managers as we try in the, at the end of this year to start to go back to normality. And the most important factor of success 
from the managing perspective, was that we had the staff with the best attitude to unlearn what they knew before the pandemic and learn new skills, apply new tools. They were also, as all the students, living their own problems, personal matters, but they also had a very important role while motivating those students who were depressed, who were tired, or who were suffering also all the effects of the pandemic. The final results that we can see with a significant increase of the satisfaction teaches that we have finally learned to manage online problems. The process has not completed, but we are more aware, we are more prepared, and we are ready to make a new strategic planning. If as managers you keep under the same strategic planning that you had before the pandemic and you want to set new goals or keep the new goals that you had before the pandemic, you will be doing wrong. This year, every educational institution should change completely the strategic planning for the next five or ten years. This global education has been installed permanently. We have to learn to keep all problems possible, to learn all the skills in the pedagogic uh, area and technical skills. We have to get used to relate to international students, to international teachers. And this is the higher education today. We have become one online school. This pandemic has made possible that I am here with you, sharing from outside the world our experience and to be enriched with everything that you have also lived. In conclusion, I can share after El Salvador's experience five key factors that you have to remind that may apply to your own university. One, hire and retain qualified professionals who are open to change and willing to constantly unlearn and learn new processes and who are oriented for innovation. Future times and today times make us uh, need to hire people who think with innovation disruptive leaders who can bring solutions for changing times. Number two, invest in training programs for your staff. Number three, select the virtual educational model after all these previous months of experience. Number four, communicate effectively and efficiently. And number five is monitor, evaluate, but most important, share the results of monitoring with the staff. They need to get involved and they will bring you the best solution. It has been a pleasure. I am very grateful on behalf of our rector at Universidad Evangelica of El Salvador. I was very glad to share our experience.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadia Manjavar. Some excellent points on dis hiring disruptive um, people who are willing to push the boundaries and go into disruptive innovation. Great, great ideas. Um, thanks for your team being present as well. As we move into our next guest, we have now Mr. Luis Ernesto Franchi, who currently works as, as rector of the Universidad de la Marina Mercante. He was secretary of extension and Vice Rector of Extension for the University Abierta Interamericana. Inter He's a specialist in university teaching and environmental diagnosis and assessment. He served as Dean of the School of Engineering at UDEM. He's a member of InnovaRed, an advisory council of the Ministry of Science and Technology in Argentina. He's an evaluator of the National Commission for University Evaluation and Accreditation in Argentina. Welcome, Mr. Luis Ernesto Franchi, to our event today. You're on mute. You may need to unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Tekalan and all the staff of North American University. We already sent to you our presentation pre-record to avoid technical issues. So I ask to the moderator if he can show the presentation to everyone. I will be available after the presentation finished for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Luis Ernesto Franchi, and I am the Universidad de la Marina Mercante Rector. It will be my pleasure to share with you my presentation today. In 2020, the cycle of face-to-face -face education was disrupted around the world. Millions of teachers and students had to relearn a new way of accessing knowledge and interacting in the cyberspace. Even the most reticent to digital culture had to get involved in the process of learning and technological appropriation. Analyze where we teach to focus on how we teach. We have the duality between presential classroom versus virtual classroom. Presential classroom is simultaneous meeting of the teacher and the students in a certain place where time and space are the variables that they limit it. And the virtual classroom mm -hmm. is meeting in a space and extended time facilitated by different digital technologies. The teachers used to the face-to-face -face teaching have to adapt their classes to an, an unknown modality and in a few days. The dimension of teaching practice related to where we teach became the priority item on teacher's agenda. Stabilizing the virtual classroom space became a necessary strategy for teachers to focus on how to teach. For some teachers, this was a challenge. For others, enough. The students expressed great concern about the diversity of different teaching strategies applied by teachers. One of the biggest difficulties detected was use the virtual classroom as a mirror of the presential classroom. We must define quality criteria in teaching practice. The how we teach 
What's the second topic of analysis in this unforeseen context, which was the beginning of a process of relearning the way to plan and manage the teaching process? We need to seek the equivalence of educational practice and contribute to the construction of study habits in students. The pedagogical modality adopted by Universidad de la Marina Mercante was the inverted classroom. And the inverted classroom has a didactic sequence. The topics of that didactic sequence are what the learning outcome is intended to be achieved in each class. What self-managing activities and students must the student must solve for that class. For example, chronic text, watch a video, analyze a case or problem among others. What activities will be carried out in the synchronous space? And what evaluative or closing activity of the class is proposed? Let's see some didactic orientations from for the planning of classes according to the modality of the inverted classroom. First, the design of the self-managing activities that the student must solve under the supervision of the teacher. Second, the design and coordination of the group communication space moderated by the teacher. And third, the design of self assessment activities for the student to reflect on the achievements achieved in the class. The inverted classroom is a pedagogical modality that involves three moments to be contemplated by the teacher in his planning and management. In class planning, when the teacher does not weigh the number of activities proposed to students, in a class and generates an excessive demand for productions that overwhelms students. In class management, when the teacher does, does not establish an articulation between asynchronous and synchronous activities and the gap between the different types of activities proposed is evident. And in class ending, when, the, when an evaluative activity is omitted that allows the student to express what has not yet managed to learn and he wants to know. Which are the quality criteria in virtual process? Basically, are two. The first is promote collaborative work between teachers, because collaborative work between teachers is conveyed to spaces for the exchange of good practices. And the second is improve the evaluation modality of learning process and outcomes. Evaluation is a constituent part of the educational process, being a serious didactic risk to develop fragmented or disjointed evaluation mechanisms of the teaching modality. The evaluation in instance of accreditation of learning but must be supported by activities equivalent to those that the student resolved until that moment. This evaluative activity cannot result for the student in a new experience different from what has been working on up to that point. This is the relevance of the integration of evaluation into the training process. Well, we'll see five steps to plan classes according to perfect classroom modality. Step one, identify what you intend students to learn. List learning outcomes, skills, techniques, procedures, conceptual or methodological frameworks that you want students to develop or incorporate. Step two, plan the class structure. Define the sequences of activities and resources that will enable the achievement of expected learning outcomes. Always keep in mind the progression of starting from previous learning 
and establishing links with the following. Design a diagram or concept map that allow you to visualize the didactic sequence of the class or its relationship to previous or later classes. This, this diagram or map is recommended to be exposed to students. Step three, design activity, activities and incorporate resources and slogans. In the pedagogical, in the pedagogical modality of the virtual classroom, the activities with their slogans are the first contact of the students with the contents of the subject. It's important to highlight three basic characteristics. Activities should be self-managing. Activities must be concatenated. Activities should be diverse and motivated. Step four, design modality and moment of communication with the classroom. This moment will suggest that it is preferably synchronous, of simultaneous contact with the students and the day at the time in which your class is scheduled in the defined schedules for the career is carried out. For this instance, the teacher proposes activities that contribute to, to consolidate learning. He reviews what the students have worked on in a self-managing way, resolves the doubts they formulate and delves into the issues that require future development. It is a requested that the video conference be recorded like this. If a student has connectivity problems, he can resume what he worked out in that video. Step five, define a student self-reflection closing activity about the class. To close the class, some individuals or group activities propose that can be resolved in the synchronous communication space or later in a way asynchronous and that ends at the self-assessment of the proposed learning outcomes at the beginning of the class. A great challenge to build. It aspires to an organization of the contents through a multimedia narrative, managing through a learning sequence that hierarchizes the collaborative work and the formation of a learning community. Thank you very much for your attention. We keep in touch. Hello everybody, my name is Ezequiel Mateo Martinich. I am the Secretary of Institutional Relations of Universidad Abierta Interamericana. And continue with our presentation, we want to share these four stages that we have been living in the last month. The, the first situation was when we received the news globally that a new pandemic was started. We need in our universities and the different universities around the world, we need to close our doors. This was a very difficult decision for everybody because we need to move for a virtual um, procedure to provide our services, our educational services, our research services, the teaching services, so all the universities around the world for a long, long time, they need to spend their classes digitally. So a digital transformation was the second stage on, on this long procedure to continue developing our services. The, the new context is how the universities need to adapt for the post-pandemic uh, time. This is the, the, the key point 
to continue providing the services. In this digital transformation, internationalization was not added and the mobility of students in addition to professors, researchers, academic authorities, a fundamental pillar of the internationalization of the institution was one first aspect that were affected by the restrictions of the international travel, affecting the students' project, but also the institutional commitments assumed between partners, universities, which all that this implies. Collaborative networking problems at the national, regional, and global levels, the rapid reaction of the university system with training, workshops, capacity buildings, adhesion of platform with the constant adjustment required by them, contribution from the state have allowed that with the beginning of the pandemic. For the following semester, a large part of the universities at the local, regional, and global levels resolved the possibilities of carrying out the exchange virtually. So in the last month, we have been living this situation. We, we are receiving students from different countries around the world. Then we need to move this virtual, this mobility, sorry, this mobility to the virtual mobility. And the picture is the second picture that we can pay attention on this uh, presentation. The students take their own classes from their homes, and now we are reopening our universities, and the students are taking some classes. A hybrid system are developing different universities in our country. What will be the future? We never know. Finally, we want to say thanks for the North American University to invite us to participate in the annual international conference. And if you want to put in contact with Mr. Franchi or with me, you can uh, get the email on this presentation. Thanks and see you soon. Thank you very much. Well, I'm sure all of you feel the same way I do. This morning has been a very impactful uh, series of presenters. We have heard from a global panel of speakers discussing the future of higher education in an online environment. And we wish to thank all our presenters for their time and expertise in contributing to building a greater learning infrastructure for generations to come. Now we get to a moment of celebration. Despite being locked in a pandemic and having to pivot our academic delivery to ensure our learners have maintained a positive learning experience, we at North American University can boast of another win. We would like to officially invite Professor Dr. Talib Obaidat of Jadera University, Jordan, and Professor Dr. Sarif Al Ali Tekelan to sign a, a memorandum of understanding on behalf of North American University and Jadera University. This memorandum of understanding is intended to develop academic and educational cooperation and to promote mutual understanding across international borders as we establish ties in Jordan. I welcome Professor Baidat of Jadera University and Dr. Tekelan on behalf of North America University to commence the official signing of this memorial document. Welcome.
So right, right after lunch, we have like the fourth closing remark by uh, Dr. Zohoki. Uh, so he will uh, be joining us by recording. And uh, we have Professor Jari Latari, who is here. And we have Dr. Kate Clement, who uh, is here. And we have Mr. Rami Sasalai, uh, Mr. Rossi. Dr. Rossi. OK. Uh, Dr. Pekka. Okay. Okay. Professor. Professor Obeda. Yes. Thank 
Some people Come take picture with us. Faces, which is really good. 
All right, one more time, please. All right, three, two, one. And of course, selfie. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I want to be in this picture too. Oh, oh my God, the other two guys. Sure, guys. Sure. Okay, now I'm doing it. Official one. Okay. It's okay. All right. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so 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 much.
Okay.
Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Box lunch never tastes so good, right? So as we move in to the closing remarks, I'd like to invite Professor Dr. Mosley Dukuhi, and I hope I got that correct. Apologies if I didn't. Who is the president of the University of Duco since 2012. He also currently serves as a member of the Board of Trustees at the American University in Kurdistan, AUK. Basically, he's a biologist. He earned his BSc from the University of Suleimani College of Agriculture in 1976 and his MSc in Plant Physiology from the same university in 1978. His PhD was earned from, from the Faculty of Biology and Environmental Protection at the University of Silesia, Poland in 2000 on cytology. His entire career is in academia. He served in different universities under different academic titles. He's a member of the ministry board at the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in, Kurdistan, in the Kurdistan region. Welcome Professor Dr. Mosley Dukohi, which is a video recording now. At the pandemic, most of the countries agreed upon implementing online education across the countries, keeping in mind the of power. On various national, state, and university level teachers and students associations were half heartedly anticipating the support of traditional formal learning teaching most of the least types of Kenya. As a result of curiosity to our new technology and the new mode of the teaching learning process in the education system. It is due to the lack of, of preparedness, orientation, and incentive of stakeholders in using online mode of teaching. The action plan was prepared. Keeping in view of our readiness for online teaching work, the right for change in this pandemic and availability of resources for implementing online teaching work. To go over the action plan, teachers prepared and trained themselves independently to be accustomed to the technology required in using online teaching works at the university level system. Administrator, information and communication technology experts provided necessary assistance to stakeholders in managing the change of process. So it is necessary for all the university to do research first to reveal the various forms of online teaching training course adopted during COVID 19 pandemic. Second, to study the preparations of teachers and students on online teaching learning during COVID-19 pandemic and there to examine the challenge faced by the teachers and students in adapting to the online teaching learning process during COVID-19 pandemic. For better or worse, traditional education is on its last legs when it comes to standardize curriculums which have remained unchanged, unchanged for the kids. The COVID-19 crisis underway. Now is the time to innovate and make a new ground in regards to the future of higher education. A shift toward digital will ensure students are equipped with digital know-how which has become mandatory for the modern job market. Enable the student to learn to learn at their own pace constantly and in creative way ways with digital technologies. While result of such an initiative couldn't be visible for years to come. Now is the time to get the ball rolling toward the future. With the concept of education changing particularly over the past two years. Students are now able to explore different learning mediums. 
more energy has transformed the way students play on by making use of internet instead of conventional class form teaching. This is more independent form of learning where the students are not required to be present at a specific place and a specific time. This form of flexibility offered by online learning is what makes it more accessible to individuals who are not able to commit to a specific time for attending a class. Here are a few other reasons. Here are a few other reasons why online learning is the future of higher education. With the ability to learn online, we have the freedom to learn from whichever place we like and whatever time we want. This is much more convenient than having to sacrifice multiple hours in a day for commute, commuting or being stuck or traffic while you are physically going to attend the class. Online learning offers the convenience of learning educational concept at home. Online learning also allows us access to education later in our life. Flexibility offered by online learning can help us in taking our own place to study. In addition to this, online learning can be customized as per our learning ability level and other individual requirements. Generally, online classes are far smaller in comparison to conventional classes in terms of the student's capacity. Most of the classes conducted online allow a single student for a particular class, and this gives way to greater interaction between the student and the teacher within, uh, within turn involves our learning experience. For online learning, people can be received quickly, which allows for the change to be implemented much more quickly when compared to the traditional way. Through online learning, there is an increased access to multiple types of materials including photos, videos, electronic books, etc. The internet space is pretty vast and almost Unlimited, which gives an infinite number of subjects and skills that can be taught and learned. With the dominance of the internet on our lives, many number of schools, colleges, and universities can be can be seen offering a variety of online version of their learning program designed for different ability levels of the applicants. From the traditional course offered by university to online chain to, to online college for specific careers, there are a variety of higher education learning programs for university students. According to several studies, the retention rates are much higher when the learning is online than the traditional forms of learning. This may be because the pressure and stress are decreased when you take when you take up online learning courses. With online learning, the students are generally allowed to learn the concept at their own pace. Also, the course material that is provided to the students is available with them for a lifetime, which they can use whenever they feel like refreshing their memory. Another reason why the retention rates are higher in online learning is due to the to the elevated learning experience. Since every student is allowed to learn at their own place, the learning experience is much better in online classes. It allows the student to access education while being placed in a comfortable setting. This makes the student have a positive attitude while learning. The online learning student would not be overweight with too much information 
Eu estou cansado de estar aqui, eu quero estar em frente de vocês. One of the reasons why all are learning is the future of the tradition is that in all are learning there is a different problem of the interaction between students and universities. This happens since the teachers provide alternate teaching methods and material at the end of the school. Unlike traditional classes, online classes allow one Chairperson of the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan. He has also served previously as president of a private university, Sabis. Coordinator General of ComSec, Director of Space Power Institute, and is a tenured prof full professor of electrical and computer engineering at Sunny Buffalo. He is a commissioner of accreditation at the Ministry of Education in UAE. Dr. Ligari was also an elected senator in the Pakistan Parliament. He is the author of many journal papers, conferences, proceedings, and books. It brings me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Lahari stage. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. This is yours. Well, you know, I just live 15 minutes from here. So I had a temptation to go back home and give my talk remotely, virtually, <laughs> online, because that is what the conference is all about. I did not have to be here, but I wouldn't have missed this wonderful lunch, <laughs> which, which you couldn't have served online. <laughs> 
So here are we, and now we are at the closing session, and has been, of course, a long day for everyone, and has been a long year, year and a half for COVID, and we are still in the middle of it, as we know. You know, we are still going perhaps through the fourth wave, the Delta variant, and one really doesn't know when the whole things will settle. The only silver lining, you know, is that we now have a vaccine, and most people actually have had the opportunity to get themselves vaccinated. But still, I hear that you know the mask mandate may return. We have learned, of course, a lot of lessons in the higher education at the university level because of COVID, and it has been a game changer, actually a disruptive game changer. And I would say a very positive one. That is the only thing that actually it has contributed to for education. That literally everything moved online, virtually remote. These three words actually became synonymous to each other. So we have virtual students, remote students, online students. You know, teaching, resources, libraries, seminars, you name it. Except, of course, like I said, food. So, so you know, but then you know we have gone through uh, what I should say lessons that have been learned because of the last one year. And one good thing actually that has come about, I would say, is that I've also served as a commissioner for accreditation. And initially, the accreditation agencies, and even in very many governments around the world, especially in the underdeveloped and the developing world, they usually look down upon online. It has to be face to face, in person, in classroom. But because of COVID, actually, you have found more acceptability of online now around the world, and the online degrees are today also treated almost as at par and equivalent to regular, you know, in classroom degrees. So that basically has become the big game changer. So once, hopefully, when life returns back to normal post pandemic what are the lessons that we have learned because of all these things and i've just pointed out about six or seven lessons that i would like to point out here one every university i would say or every institute should offer online programs all the way from associates to the doctoral degree because like i said you know it has become more acceptable so the accessibility factor should actually increase and every single program, or I would say across every single university, must literally go online because now there is full acceptability. Number two, the students must devote as much attention, time, and effort to online as they do to in-classroom teaching. Usually, you know, we know that students learn new methods by typically logging on and logging off to show attendance. But I think from the student part, there has to be much more seriousness in terms of learning online. Then three, for the faculty, you know, of course, there have been the traditional standard methods of online teaching, but now they must try to develop new innovative methods and techniques because now we have gone through a whole experience of year and a half and we have learned new lessons. So it's time to develop further and move ahead innovatively so we can improve upon various teaching methodologies and skills. Number four, the learning resources, particularly the platforms, the libraries. Of course, we have had a long history of online resources through libraries, but the particularly on you know, the platforms, you know, for example, Microsoft Team, Zoom, they had become extremely popular. And then, of course, there are many other platforms that the educational institutes have traditionally always used, including the learning management systems. So one has to go back and even these companies that, that develop these platforms have to get feedback from the universities, from the faculty, from the students, so they can actually move into the next level up or upgrade their systems. So all the bugs that we have faced, we should be able to uh, fix those bugs. And number five, one important thing like I, is, is I would say was missing was the typical the experience that a student has when he or she attends a university or a classroom or an institute in terms of extracurricular activities, clubs, breakouts, even standing in line, you know, when you go to an accounts office 
or when you stand in line to buy coffee. So these are the type of experiences that actually have the students particularly have missed out in terms of the whole ecosystem of an higher education system. So that is one deficiency that has actually gone through and one needs to find ways and means of making online learning more interesting for the students. So we are able to attract more and more students to this. And lastly, like I said, uh, especially when I mentioned the regulatory agencies, you know, like ABET, for example, in engineering, AACSB, and then we also have the state accreditation agencies who initially were very conservative in terms of recognizing or giving equivalence to online learning and degree programs. I think now, of course, there is a change. So even these regulatory agencies have to go back to their own drawing board and they have to treat all all online degrees and programs as equal and as par as regular inline courses. So I think these are the typical lessons that we have learned. And thank you again for finding the time to listen to me. Well, Dr. Lagari, I'm glad that you did decide to join us for lunch. So, yeah, <laughs> excellent, excellent. I now would like to invite someone who's close to home, one of our very own, the Honorable Dr. Tita V. Banks, who's the Director of University Advancement and Development at North American University. She also serves on the advisory board of North American University. Prior to joining NAU, Dr. Banks served in faculty and administration positions at several institutions and agencies. Positions held include director of the Mellon Foundation program at Spelman College, member of the advisory board of the Honors College at Texas Southern University, liaison for the White House Initiative on HBCUs, director of the Martin Luther King Association for Nonviolence, and program director at Rutgers University. She also works with diplomatic and human rights organizations, having served as the honorary counsel of the Republic of Liberia, chair of the United Nations, Nations Association of the USA, and president of the Consular Corps of Philadelphia. Dr. Banks is the recipient of many awards, including Distinguished Daughter of Liberia, Global Goodwill Ambassador, Human Relations Commission's Chairman Award and was one of the top 30 influential women of Houston. She attended Wesley College, Howard University, Wayne State University and Oxford University. She holds an Ed D in Leadership and Management. She has also received certifications in Human Rights Education, training from the U.S. Institute of Diplomacy, the Sustainable Development Goals from the University of Copenhagen, and Global Diplomacy from the University of London. I am so pleased to have you here with us, Dr. Banks. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. This has been such a wonderful day. Uh, and all of the speakers have given so much information that has been helpful, productive, and challenging. So um, I'm bringing greetings to everyone and thank you for attending the 2021 International Education Conference here at North American University. As we close this year's conference, we acknowledge that the global COVID-19 pandemic has forced higher education institutions not only to transition to online teaching and learning, but also has brought up new issues in the context of an online environment, such as technological capability, access, faculty readiness, courts redesign, affordability, retention and success of students, et cetera. The aim of this international conference has been to share experiences learn about how higher education in different countries has been transforming and what is perceived as a future of higher education in an online environment. The COVID-19 pandemic that closed institutions, blocked international travel 
and lockdown cities throughout the world threaten the very core of many of our institutions. Over 400, I'm sorry, over 40,000 universities worldwide found themselves faced with a critical existential question. How do we continue in a state of global pandemic? For a few universities, online education was already in their modality. However, for most, online education was only a small portion of their course and program offerings. The challenges were critical. Safety assurance, access, technology, faculty readiness, course redesign, affordability, retention, and success of students. The existential question for institutions of higher education, as well as K through 12 schools, required an answer. This 2021 conference has provided an arena in which to share experiences, innovations, best practices, and new visions of higher education as we move forward in this century. This new environment is full of possibilities and expansion, and the new visions are expansive. On a local level, online ed higher education can be a greater gateway to ensure access for all students, regardless of physical capability, geography, time constraints. This new environment can also be an equalizer to ensure equitable and inclusive access for so many people. According to a Brookings Institute report, to successfully transform to online education, quote, institutions need to plan and start developing high quality student-centered online programs. High quality uh, and noted quickly stand up robust systems of support in areas such as academic advising, administrative functions, IT, tutoring, and more. Faculty need to be trained, making their training materials available for free, which we have started doing and we've been working on this here at North American for the past half year. IT staff need not only to get on top of their technology stack, starting with the learning management systems, our LMS, but also develop good customer relationship management platforms to support advising functions and the suite of other necessary tools. On the global level, they include intersecting with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or we call them the Global Goals or the SDGs. Education is stated under goal number four of the SDGs, quoted in, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. According to a report from the UN Secretary General on the progress towards the sustainable development goals, education is a core aspect of the SDGs and considered essential to their success. The global efforts also enumerated in the Incheon Declaration and the Education 2030 Framework for Action by the UN include the following, achieving effective and inclusive partnerships which is what we just did this afternoon, improving education policies and the way they work together. And three, ensuring highly equitable, inclusive and quality education systems for all. The elements of partnerships, policies and proactive innovative educational systems are what we have discussed today. Together, we can continue to work together to share technologies and programs, increase international experiences for our students and our researchers. In addition, and a unique element in this new vision is the expansion of international education. The American Council on Education convened a panel of experts from a variety of countries to discuss the changing roles and priorities of higher education in an increasingly globalized world. The panel composed of presidents and other leaders of higher educational institutions observed the following, quote, higher education exists in and is very much affected by a world that increasingly operates across sovereign borders. Just as countries have become more interconnected worldwide, 
so too have colleges and universities. This new reality is much more than just a phenomena. Rather, it embodies a wholly new way of thinking and working. In the 21st century, higher education is explicitly and fundamentally a global enterprise. So globally, we have more than 207 million students in higher education at over 40,000 institutions. As international institutions, the new vision includes expanding the opportunities for our students to study abroad through the operate, uh, opportunities generated by our institutions, partnerships and interconnectedness. So welcome El Salvador. Many institutions participating at this conference have already begun meeting these challenges and the successes have been noted. The successes have always also been reflected in the number of students in higher education. Internationally, more students than ever are attending college. We know that between 2000 and 2014, the number of students in higher education globally more than doubled to 207 million. Although some universities experienced uh, decreases last year at the height of the pandemic, with the transitions and technological developments by universities, we anticipate the numbers to continue to increase. As our institutions enter this newly developing environment, we enter with anticipation of the many possibilities and innovations that can arise. We have all experienced change and transitions in these last 18 months. As one theorist put it, quote, change is impossible without learning, just as learning is impossible without change. Our institutions are moving forward, expanding technologies, courses, structures to meet the needs of students in our societies. Our institutions, as evidenced in the presentations at this conference, are affecting changes in knowledge creation and changes in technological developments to advance online education. North American University joins you in this effort and welcomes the opportunity to develop and expand opportunities and partnerships in this great new environment. Thank you. Isn't she amazing? Let's hear it for Dr. Banks again. <laughs> At this point, I'd like to welcome Mr. Ramiz Tafilaj. Mr. Ramiz Tafilaj is an Albanian American businessman, philanthropist, activist, and publisher. He attended the University of Zagreb before immigrating to the United States in 1974 and continued his higher education in Houston. After starting his career as a computer programmer, Mr. Tafilaj became a successful entrepreneur in the high-tech and petrochemical industries. He founded Superior Computer Services and Progressive Chemical Technology, where he serves as the chairman of the board. He also owns the Jafilat Publishing Company. Tafilaj, Mr. Tafilaj served as a president of the Northwest Chamber of Commerce International Division, where he was promoted across a number of functions and represented delegations in countries throughout Europe and Asia. He is Vice President of the Albanian American Business Association of Greater Texas. In 2018, Mr. Tafilaj was honored with the President's Lifetime Achievement Award, the highest distinction given to civilians <laughs> who model the American spirit. In his hometown of Deacon, he re received recognition from his peers for his contributions in promoting democracy through his work in publishing. And in 2020, Mr. Tafelage received Idris Safari Freedom Certificate for his contributions in educating the community's youth in Jilan. Welcome, Mr. Tafelage.
so after such an introduction and speaking after such a wonderful speaker, I'm going to need a little encouragement. So I hope you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I have learned a lot here today. I enjoyed every speaker here because I'm learning about the future of our education. I'm not here to talk about the future of education because I don't think I'm qualified for that. And I, I'm on you. I, there's nothing I can say. But I'm going to remind everybody how I used to be when I was a student and how hard it was to be a student in my days. If my father, Recep Tafila, will see me today speaking in front of so many scholars, he will be very proud of me that I am sharing his thoughts, but also my beliefs now about education. We were nine brothers and sisters and me. For us, education was very hard. It meant that we had to plow the fields, attend the livestock, do all the work, walk three, four, maybe five kilometers every day to go back and forth to school, often not to even know where the next meal is coming from. But my father made us all promise that we will continue with education. And one day we will return to the others if we able to achieve something. In this way, we decided that uh, I will go and study in University of Zagreb. I'm not following my speech. I decided to go in University of Zagreb. And because at that time, we're talking about 1970, 71, 72, there was no online programming or program. Many students have to go across ocean or across the universe for that matter to study. And I was lucky because at that time, my wife, Diane, had to come to University of Zagreb for off-campus uh, study languages at that time, where I met her. And I can say she was very smart because I convinced and she accepted to marry me. And we, here we are in Houston living very happy. <laughs> so I think, Diane, you were very smart, but I was very lucky. <laughs> uh, I worked very hard with my, with my children. I pushed them very, very hard. I did not accept anything less than A. I made them during the weekends, they work in all the math work, in all the uh, lessons that they learned over the, over the week. And they didn't like that, but they had to do it because we were trying to live the father figure image and then all the children were listening to me. I thought one day they're going to hate me, but in fact, that turned the opposite. I saw them pushing just as hard their own children. My son, Basim, after he finished university in, here in, uh, in uh, Austin, he flew every weekend from Houston to Chicago at Northwestern University to get MBA degree and also raise a family here in Houston. I can see how he pushes his children today. His, his son, who is 14, is actually know more math than I do or, or, or I did in that time because we used to have this um, slide rule, Schibler, and now they have all the computers, they have everything that you can imagine. And you, you know, I, I never imagined that so many resources can be here in this United States of America. My daughter, Bessa, <laughs> she decided that she wants to be a reporter and she graduated also from UT in Austin. And very soon she became a reporter here in, in, uh, in Texas, first in um, San Angelo. From there, she moved to North Carolina as a bureau chief for ABC News. And then finally she moved to uh, Washington and she decided that she's going to raise a family, but as a reporter it will be very difficult. So she now works for nonprofit organization the Military Family Association of the United States. She's chief executive there. And she also got her the master's degree in the military base because of her hard work and desire to, to, to educate herself. And I see that her children are also being pushed very hard and I am very happy to see that culture going on. And I wish we all can push our children to go because you never push enough to learn. Learning is must. My son, Doreen, youngest one, I needed someone to help me, so he stayed close here to Houston and helped me with 
grow in my petrochemical industry business. And also at the same time going to the University of Houston where he graduated. Now he lives in Washington, DC. He continued with our business. We have a branch over there. And his daughter is one of those young, young uh, children that received presidential awards for knowledge last year. So about presidential award, I, I got awarded by President Trump. I didn't know how that happened, but that happened. And I told the President Trump at that time that one thing that he did correct, if everything was wrong, is awarding me because I think I deserve it. He was very happy <laughs> to hear that. And asked me, is there anything else that I did right? I said, yes, you married very beautiful girls from Slovenia. <laughs> because Slovenia and Kosovo, they were same countries. I was uh, pushed to work very hard for the freedom and independence in Kosovo and in former Yugoslavia in general and in Albania. So I made many trips overseas and we decided that now since we have a means, we're going to support other students. So thank to Diane that she accepted my idea. We start bringing the students from all over the world, from Russian Siberia, from Turkey, from Egypt, from Middle East, from Mexico, from United States. So we had hundreds and hundreds of students that we sponsored. By say, when we say sponsored, we paid their tuitions. Some of them we housed in our own house and for free. We bought their books. We visited their family. We convinced, convinced them that this is the way that they do it and that education is the only way to go for it. So today, my students, and some of, some of them actually came in this university, and today are very important. One of them is a, a deputy minister in Kosovo. We have a doctor, we have engineers, we have lawyers. Uh, we even have a military scholars that uh, from, this from this university, but also from other universities around, around the United States. I will look some more notes here. Yes, I said all, all the students coming from mostly from my country, from Kosovo, but also from everywhere. Our biggest enjoyment is when we go back to the countries and visit our students. I go very often to Turkey because I had some students over there. I, I, I actually feel like I'm in my home because culture is very close. We were under five or six hundred years under the Ottoman Empire, so we are about the same culture, regardless am I Albanian or is they are Turks or wherever. I, I've been to Russia, I've been to Egypt, I've been to many countries, and everywhere we go, I can tell you I feel so very happy and so very proud to see less people that studied right here, that actually they become something. Matter of fact, one of the top reporters in Afghanistan was a student here in, in the University of Houston that I sponsored, and he's one of the top reporters today in Afghanistan, and he promotes democracy in every way. I had uh, all kinds of issues with the students, you can imagine, coming from different worlds. I had a student who hated everything except wherever it came from his country. But in due time, he started loving everything and making all kinds of friends and actually sharing rooms with those friends and books and become very close friends. But what's important in here to, to mention, they are all were studying without being infected with ideology, regardless what this ideology was, uh, dictatorship, communism, or forever. I think those who are scared of uh, uh, education are the losers. I will anytime face somebody educated than some uneducated one because education will help you think and will help you find a way going forward and, and make this world a better, better place to live. I'm sure all the scholars here are going to think about the future, future of our children. And I know that our children and grandchildren will, will be in good hands when, when I know that so many scholars here and everywhere else like this one, this university will continue to work for the better of our children. I wanted to also say that uh, for me, online, it's necessary if you don't have means 
or if you're in a country that you cannot come here. But face to face, coming to the to the campus is very, very important. You get very great feeling. But thanks to online, many other countries that's really like take my, my uh, country, for example, they cannot afford the tuitions and uh, living expenses and everything to come to the United States, but they can manage to do this and get the diplomas from, from the country where they are. So that's why I think that the, the, the uh, online education is important. I also think that <clears throat> Universities should reach across the world because that's how we can build bridges. I think United States have a right idea. They accept students from abroad and they send students abroad because usually when this happens, some friendship will develop. Despite how much I dislike or what's happened in Yugoslavia, I always loved Zagreb because that's where I was a student and that's where I learned my my education, and I never could have think something bad about Zagreb. So that's why it's important to have children from all, all over the world come to United States, but also go back to the countries and share this kind of, this kind of experiences. At the end, I wanna say, may God bless you, the professors and students of this facility, this university. May God bless, and I wanted to congratulate you Dr. Sharif, and I hope God gives you a good health and gives you all the means you need to take this institution next level up. You have been doing a great job, and I hope to see this university grow every day. Thank you for having me here, and I hope I did not bother too much. Thank you. By the way, my name is Thank you very much. So before we move on to the vote of tanks and other proceedings, we've got a couple people that's online with us. So if you want to just share the screen, I'd like to invite Nadia Manjava of UES to say a few words at this time. Thank you. Um, well, for us, from El Salvador, it has been a great experience. I really um, congratulate everyone who has been uh, in the backstage because there is a lot of work to make this happen. And I think all of us should uh, promote these uh, international experiences. We have so much to learn. And if you can see, all of us are, are living the same issues. So I think we can grow all together and you, all of us should promote more contact and in this virtual media, uh, we're just uh, one button close to each other. So really, uh, I'm really thankful for the invitation and you're welcome to come here or meet together next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adia Mandreville. Now I'd like to call on Dr. Rosanna Valeria de Sousa e Silva. Dr. De Silva? Okay, I'm here. So I first of all, I would like you to thank one thing more, more Dr. Sharif de Calan, Dr. Farouk, and the whole team that organization this important event. And I'd like to say that it was a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to share some ideas with the distinguished speakers. And the, uh, thank you for all, all of you. You can count on me. We can, we can count you on our universities. As, we, as, as you know, I am executive director of Coimbra Group of Brazil University International um, group of international cooperation group of brazil universities composed by 89 universities and the, we we are open to continue to work together and the, even virtually we have a lot of things to do and you must do thank you very much and the congratulations for all participants thank you.
thank you, Professor De Silva, for your contribution. At this point, I'd like to ask Mr. Ahmed Ben Taleb of ITBS to say a few words. Thank you so much. So uh, I am Ahmed Ben Taleb. I am a computer science teacher and uh, researcher at IT Business School, which is a uh, uh, Tunisian private uh, university. So uh, my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Safa, uh, she will explain the, our uh, teaching approaches uh, using uh, virtual uh, classes. Uh, and uh, I will uh, just uh, give some, some advice about uh, uh, approaches that we use it like blended learning, right? video lessons, what we call uh, project-based uh, learning, quizzes, active pedagogy, uh, and others uh, approaches. Uh, our experience uh, at Tunisia and uh, at our uh, university, which is IT Business School, uh, we used uh, some uh, popular uh, platforms like Microsoft Teams and uh, Zoom, uh, uh, Google uh, Suite, which is now a Google Workspace for Education. And uh, it is clear that using our own uh, platforms uh, help us to regulate and uh, to parameterize and to uh, adjust the platform uh, to our uh, object, with, which is uh, education uh, via uh, synchronous and asynchronous teaching, uh, because it, it was uh, for the first time fully uh, synchronous, which is not in the favor of uh, our uh, learners. Then using the, pa the second part, which is asynchronous teaching like uh, classrooms and uh, uh, like uh, tools, uh, we, we can uh, use the offline class in this time to give uh, the opportunity to, to a student to move from uh, the uh, uh, or what we call a presential class to uh, uh, online classes smoothly. Uh, now I will uh, just uh, say a few words to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Tekalan and Dr. Farouk. Uh, it was uh, for me uh, a great pleasure. For me, this is uh, the first time uh, to attend to this annual conference by uh, North, uh, North American University. Uh, thank you so much. Congratulations to the entire team uh, for organizing this great event. And uh, see you next time. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Ben Taleb. Now we save Mr. Mosley Dukohi to, to, to say a few words. Mr. Dukohi, please come on. First of all, I would like to express my sincere thanks to my colleague, Professor Takanan, for inviting me to this uh, conference. And I would like to congratulate all of you for this successful conference. I can say that for better or worse, traditional education is in its last stages and it is necessary for the universities to think and to find a constant system for future education because of the pandemic and uh, all of us uh, every day are hearing that the, the new than the, the, the used vaccines, for example, Pfizer BioNTech, Oxford AstraZeneca, Sinopharm, Moderna, they are not working with the new variant, unfortunately, for example, the Delta variant. So it is necessary to find a constant system of the future learning. Thank you all. Thank you very much. As we wrap up today's conference titled Future of Higher Education in an Online Environment, I would like to move the vote of thanks on behalf of North American University. We opened today's proceedings with Dr. Tekalan sharing our university's experience during the pandemic as we made a number of pivots to remain as connected to our students, not only from an academic, but pastoral care of our students and faculty, which indeed was a major concern to North American University as we navigated the unknown. We later heard from Professor Dr. Mohammed Taleb Obidiat, the president of Jadari University in Jordan on their shifts during the pandemic and how those changes impacted the direction of higher learning in Jordan. He focused a great deal on the platforms, teaching methodologies, challenges, 
and advantages that came with the experience of online teaching in Jordanian universities. Our plethora of distinguished presenters focused on similar experiences at their institutions of higher education that kept learning relevant, collaborative, and educational during the last 18 months. There are so many key takeaways from today's conference that I am more empowered leaving than I came. I made some notes during those, those presentations today, as did many of you. Professor Odolatov shared stakeholder impact, and I found the sense of purpose during that presentation when reference was made about moving away from assessing how they were doing in response to COVID-19, but shifted focus to use the stress and strain of the pandemic to change towards a deeper, more action-oriented focus on their stakeholders. Dr. Safa Fenia and her team shared best practices on how they use their business IT school to provide knowledge and limit the disruptions on education during the pandemic through efficient teaching strategies. I was so happy to hear Luis Ernesto Franchi and team share that the pandemic has revealed what Arthur Machado taught us not, many, not long ago. There is no way. The way is made by walking. During the pandemic, there were times when many of us felt lost. We did not know the way forward. When we could no longer walk, we crawled. But I believe most of us found our way back up and is carving new paths as we chart into a new unknown, more empowered. Today's conference showcased so many pieces of scholarly tested research in a relatively short space of time as we navigated our ways through uncertainty and challenges that would have otherwise been disastrous had we not come together like we are today sharing best practices. Imagine a virus that was by nature of its existence, intent on separating and dividing. But through technologies and education, we found a way to not just survive, but to thrive and rise. I say thank you to everyone present today. Thank you for your dedication and passion to the field of knowledge creation and learning. I now open the floor for feedback and comments. Do we have questions? Any comments? Anyone would like to come up and say a few words? I, I would like to say a few words. Well, this is truly international, but I would like to thank you, Dr. Tekelin, because all of the people that you see presented, uh, his uh, personal contact, so he, he worked so hard to communicate during the commencement, actually, he started the commencement uh, program, and, uh, and uh, so he communicated to all, all of these people, you know, we had about 60, University president spoke, addressed our, uh, the commencement, and he, he reached out about 30 some. And uh, we we were really hoping to end them over here in person. I couldn't imagine, you know, that would be the scope and the landscape of this conference. Hopefully, this will be later a year for COVID environment. So hopefully, we won't have any other pandemic <laughs> upcoming. So uh, next year, I could be a whole different ball game and more people, more engaging, more. Um, uh, production and everything. And I'd like to thank also NC, the Dr. Singh, and Mr. Miller, that's behind the scene. Also, NC has a great job, you know, and I'm happy. Yay! And also, Dr. Embroca, a host on an art committee, and Ms. Shreta, and Dr. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Andrew. You know, in the community. Any other comments? I like the volunteer my wife. Absolutely. My wife. The floor is open. I wonder, Katala, how did she feel by having all these students coming through her house? <laughs> Do you want to come up? She's always volunteering me to speak about something. <laughs> Welcome. I'd just like to say that we, we've learned probably more from the students than, than they learned uh, by their experience here. And, and we continue to learn as we travel to their, their homes and their countries. And, it's really been a wonderful experience, and I really appreciate being here and understanding uh, and appreciating what the uh, universities are going through because we often 
think about the students, you know, my goodness, the students can't be in person because they're having problems, but really you can see that there's a, a large administrative uh, challenge as well as putting uh, staff and all these I've become able to appreciate that more. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I just got a brilliant idea, and this is the lecturer in me passing the baton as we go along. Mr. Tass, we're just going to randomly pick people. A few t words on what you got from today's session. One of the main things I cannot uh, some small things, sure. uh, the online, not the online feedback, Sometimes face to face, sometimes all together, sometimes online, of course. There was one novelist in Turkey before 1960. He was very famous. He was reading so much. He was a very nice intellectual, Peyami Safa. And, and uh, he read so much. One day, he said the real story, not story, real story. He thought that, uh, yes, uh, I read very nicely. If I meet in the future, the doctor, yes, uh, I, uh, I can read the medical books, and then I can treat myself, right? <laughs> exactly, he began, and then he wrote, he, he read so many books in medical. And one day, he, he got sick. Ah, this is the turn, this is my turn. I can do it. He wrote his plans. No they are no meeting, vertigo, stomach ache. And then he said, turns out I was pregnant, but I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> it is not only online and also FaceTime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So Dr. Tass, it comes back to you. <laughs> I didn't forget. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think I'm the last person to uh, say a few, few words, but uh, it was very nice and productive for me. And I'm sure uh, any of you had the same feeling. Um, as the faculty point and the, you know, the department uh, uh, side, we are we have been dealing this uh, about for uh, half years. I'm working with specifically with the faculties how to handle, how to bring the teaching to the students. It was a huge challenge for us in so many different perspectives, not just um, uh, bringing the curriculum uh, to the online, but also bringing students inside of the classroom in this individual uh, uh, virtual uh, atmosphere. So I think we learned a lot. Uh, our faculty learned a lot. We, the challenge was big. Um, older faculty, younger faculty, uh, students with the internet, uh, Wi-Fi, and all those. I mean, you cannot imagine. So this type of um, conference is, I think, very helpful. This is the first time that I'm uh, seeing uh, uh, after the COVID environment. Uh, uh, but I think we need a lot, this type of uh, very actual, real, real time uh, uh, learning atmosphere, not just um, administrative level, but at different, at different levels as well. Thank you so much. It, uh, like Dr. Taban said, uh, the Dr. Tekalan brought all this, but there's a huge team uh, efforts. Um, I hope to see different version of this type of meetings in the near future. Thank you very much, Dr. Tass. Does anyone want to say a few words? Everybody again, um, Dr. Ekalat, Dr. Tavan, for the invitation. Um, so unlike many of you in the room, and I think to my compatriots here, we're one of the few academicians in the room here. Um, that being said, you know I have a unique perspective in various sectors throughout the economy, uh, working for one of the largest banks in the country. You know, invariably we see insights to the what the pandemic has done in almost every sector within the not only the U.S. economy but the global economy. And many of you that are streaming live, you know, you are seeing changes in your economies because of what the pandemic has done. But more importantly, I think what we're seeing is out of great destruction comes great creation. 
And we've seen that, as my esteemed colleague here must know as a historian, that we've seen that many, many times again in human history. And probably we'll look back almost ourselves and we were alive during a point when, you know, not a lot of humans have seen such level of destruction and, and unfortunately the human toll and the millions that have died because of the pandemic. But what we've done in spite of the pandemic, I think, which is most important. And, you know, many generations like your grandchildren that you spoke of, um, that will look back and say, okay, we not only went through it, but we went and did a whole lot better. And the level of technology that comes from this has accelerated, I think, our ability to adapt and thrive, as Dr. Singh just mentioned. Thank you again. Dr. Dr. Taufik wants to say a few yeah, words. I don't have that much to say, but yeah. I want to thank our participants for being patient with us. We keep sending them email after email, follow up email, that email, this email. And thank, I want to thank them because they are awake right now and they are, I believe they are in the midnight now over there and they are about to sleep. And thank you for being awake and being with us and participating and contributing to this wonderful conference. Thank you very much and I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Mosley, for being awake to this time. Thank you, sir. Well, you are welcome. Thank you. Yes, Rosana, do you hear me? Yes, Dr. Sharif, I can. I'm here. Say my salutation, please. Uh, first to your daughter, and second to our friends, uh, the academician and moderator. And uh, Nadia, uh, you hear me? Unfortunately, there is a team here, very much, and a very young team from Salvador. And please uh, say my salutation uh, to Rector Dr. Christina and also the chairman of the Trust of Spain. Okay? Okay, okay, we'll. Thank you. Dorki, Abi, you hear me, Dorki? Yes, Dorki. yes, yes, Dr. Shafiq. Unfortunately, yes. Idris Abi couldn't come. It is Abel Ahmed Özpaş. Say our salutation also to them, inshallah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to? Uh, quick, if we don't, we don't need it, you can hear it uh, quick. Uh, no, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can hear all. All right, uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody, but I realized that uh, Dr. Farouk Toban, he thanked everyone, which is rightly so, but he actually deserved a big thank because he has a lot to do with arranging this. So thank you, Dr. Mr. Nida, do you want to say a few words? Okay, so if there's not, no, no other comments, feedback, questions, I would officially like to close off today's session. I'd like to express thanks on behalf of North American University for everyone that came and spent their day with us, shared their knowledge, their time, and you know, I think together we have shared so much best practices that as a team we can go back and, and make the fall semester really rewarding as we bring on our students, bring them back into colleges, you know, welcome them back. They've been online, a lot of them, most of them, for the last 16 to 18 months. They may have developed habits that are not desirable habits, like not wearing pants to class and stuff. So we got to get them in the habit of dressing up and getting back into campus and, you know, engaging and collaborating and just being students and enjoying that student life. So on behalf of North American University, I'd like to thank everybody who put this together, made it, you know, such an amazing event. And I look forward to having another one next year. Thank you all. And uh, actually, uh, sorry about the uh, uh, Ahmed bin Talib, Professor Rosana, Professor Dohoki, and Professor Manjua. I'd like to invite all the face-to-face -face participants to our lovely garden to get a family picture. But I will take a picture on the <laughs> on the uh, the uh, screen. We will add them. We will add them. We will we will we will add them in Photoshop for you guys.
So I would like to invite everyone uh, to our uh, garden, uh, the the yard, to uh, take a, a, uh, another picture, family picture. So to ha have a family bond. All right, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 